Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is Fred Provenza, Professor Emeritus of Behavioral Ecology in the Department of Wildland Resources at Utah State University. Dr. Provenza directed an award-winning research group that pioneered an understanding of how learning influences foraging behavior and how behavior links soil, plants, herbivores, and humans. That work culminated in a program called BEHAVE, an international network of scientists, ranchers, farmers, and land managers committed to integrating behavioral principles with local knowledge to enhance environmental, economic, and cultural values of rural and urban communities. Though BEHAVE is no longer active, the principles and practices continue to influence researchers and managers worldwide. He is the author of three books and has published over 300 research papers in a wide variety of scientific journals. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind, and to live their dreams. And now here are Paul and Fred talking about food farming and our future. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D. Today, we are going to talk about food, farming, and your future with an exclamation mark behind it. My guest today is Fred Provenza, who I'm really excited to share with you guys. Um, Autumn Smith, uh, founder of Paleo Valley, who's a great friend of mine, and as you surely know by now, sponsor of our podcast. Turn me on to Fred's work, and I read some of his papers. His uh, Fred, those are really classified as scientific papers, aren't they? Yes, Paul. Yeah, so they were fantastic, and um, in fact, so fantastic, I emailed them to several people and said, "You need to read this." <laughs> and uh, so I'm really excited to talk to you about food farming and our future. Uh, Fred's got a book titled Nourishment, What Animals Can Teach Us About Rediscovering Our Natural Wisdom. And based on the research papers I've read and a slideshow he shared with me, uh, that's probably a very important book to read. He has other books he'll mention as we go. So Fred, welcome to Living 4D with me and you. Thank you, Paul. Wonderful to be here with you as well. Thank you. Um, Fred, I've been working in the field of health and performance for 38 years, and looking at your bio, you've been at it longer than I have. Can you give us an overview of your background, education, and what led you to put so much focus on nutrition and regenerative agriculture, and um, to look so closely at nutrient values of meats relative to plants? Because I thought that was very, very interesting, and you've done a lot of work in that area, which is, there's not many people doing that. For me, Paul, it started as a youth. As far back as I can remember, to as young as I was, I I was fascinated by wild things, from insects to birds, fishes, mammals. If it was moving, I was interested in it, just fascinated in the world of nature. Um, During high school, I worked in a greenhouse and... uh, During my senior year in high school, a friend asked me if I'd like to earn some extra money hauling hay on a ranch. (laughs) I had no experience whatsoever with ranching, farming, um, but I thought, sure, I'll do it. And I I absolutely loved it, actually. Absolutely loved what was going on out there. So when I went to college, I majored in wildlife biology, but I also was working summers on that ranch. Um, And we were doing some farming, raising alfalfa, crops like barley and oats on a small scale. But we were also working with cattle, sheep, goats, hogs, raising a, a gauntlet of different different species. So all that was a really a formative part of my education, I would say. And that combination, which we can come back to as we go on, of wildlife biology and those views, and then the ranching, farming, hands-on part of things was really, uh, really had a huge influence on everything that I did throughout my throughout my my life. Um, when I finished school at Colorado State University, I loved it. I, I loved learning about the natural world. But I knew that I wouldn't be a wildlife biologist. I don't know how I knew. I just knew I wasn't going to pursue that. But I didn't know what I wanted to do. 
So I went back to the ranch. Uh, Henry DeLuca, the owner of the ranch, needed someone to manage it. So I spent two years on that ranch running the ranch year round. It gave me time just to reflect and think about what might be interesting. And I don't know why on earth this occurred to me, but I thought research would be, I miss, I was missing when I finished at Colorado State University, I said, I've had enough formal education for this lifetime. I, I'm going to go. Do, but I found how much I missed learning, learning, learning. And so I, uh, Started thinking, well, maybe I should go to grad school. Long story short, I ended up at Utah State University in a program that was very interesting and attractive. During my years, and this will get to some of your questions later on, during my years in wildlife biology, it was clear that people in wildlife weren't necessarily fond of people that were involved in farming and ranching. They saw ranching and livestock in particular as degraders of landscapes. Well, the program at Utah State that I got into and had been going on for, I would say, 30, 40, 50 years was about how to use domestic animals to enhance, to improve landscapes for wild species. And I thought, this is beautiful. You know, yeah. it's not this polarization kind of business. It's how do we do things? So I ended up in that program. I ended up working with goats, using goats to, to rejuvenate landscapes dominated by a shrub called black brush, which we can get into a little bit. Um, and that, that led then to a lifelong interest in behavioral ecology of plants and animals and uh, takes us to where we are right now with me 13 years retired from that career, actually, but still actively involved. Yeah, that's very good. I, I, you know, I come, I was raised on a farm and, and, you know, my whole childhood was right there in the dirt, working with the animals. My father was the president of the farming association and uh, my mother's a yogi and, and, you know, my parents were very holistic and oftentimes when money was tight, we lived completely off our farm. And so I kind of have a similar background, you know, starting with hands-on and, you know, seeing how it all works and and also as an athlete getting to i i noticed that i went to school out in the country that was mostly farmers kids and whenever we played against city teams where people ate more you know the traditional commercial garbage we just wiped them out they just didn't have the strength or the endurance and so my first real nutrition observation was, wow, people that eat a lot of, you know, Coca-Cola chips, box cereals, they, they got something missing that the rest of us farm boys have. So it, it sort of set me up for my athletic career as well. Yes, very good points that you're making. You know, one of the things that struck me, Paul, about the years on the ranch um, was the hard physical work. Which, uh, man, absolutely. You know, just what you're talking about eating wholesome foods, which we absolute, absolutely did, growing and raising your own. Uh, we grew our own gardens. We butchered our own hogs, butchered our own beef. We hunted, we foraged. It was a, it was a fantastic lifestyle in that sense. But that physical, you know, the hard work, the hard physical work was, uh, and in those days I was young and really strong and I loved it. I absolutely loved doing that kind of, of work. The other thing that struck me about the years on the ranch uh, was innovation, this idea of innovation. We, we were very self-reliant, not that we didn't occasionally have other people come and, and fix a machine or something, but for the most part, everything that we could do on our own, we did on our own. And I think that that's an amazing thing to learn that as a young person. And I often think, and I don't mean this to be disparaging, but as we moved away from that kind of a society that, that was mainly people involved in farming and ranching kind of activities to people living in cities, that we've really, that there's a lot that's been lost that, uh, in that, in that sense, I, I just that, think that self-reliance and that I can do it, whatever it is, I can figure it out, I can do it. Um, and that, for me, came out of just being out there working on the ranch and, uh, and day in, day out, dealing with, with the natural world, with, uh, with the machines, with whatever we needed to do. It, it was one wonderful, um, a wonderful 
wonderful experience for me. And really, I often look back on life and think about how experiences shape shape you and influ influence what you you become and how for me there was no there was no expectations i wasn't thinking oh i'm going to go to a ranch and all work you know these things happen and they in retrospect you look back and you think my goodness that that was huge huge influence on everything i did and i never even thought about it it was not a deliberate thing on my part yeah, you know, one of the things I noticed, you know, I left school, um, I, I finished the ninth grade, but I, I just found it so frustrating because I couldn't get my questions answered by the teachers. And I just got to the point where I felt like I, from working on our farm, I, I could already weld, I could repair engines. I, I went to trade school when I was 18 to for automotive and industrial repair. But on the farm, you know, like you said, often farms don't have a lot of extra money. It's, it's not like you're rolling in the dough kind of thing. It's you got to be real practical and down to earth and and creative. And, uh, you know, the way my father was, it's like. There's a problem. Fix it. I don't care what you got to do. Call the neighbors. Do whatever you got to do. I'll be back in two hours. Fix it or else. And the or else meant fix it. And. Um, you know, so I found that I had to learn to think and I had to learn to problem solve. And then when I became, you know, a father and entered the work world, I became a, a father when I just turned 18. So I, I was off out in the work world and I was just shocked at how people couldn't solve problems. They, they would just sit around and wait for somebody else to come fix things. And I'm like, you guys, this is not that hard to fix. And and I, I I share that with you. I really I really think that um, a lot of young people today would be well served, and in, instead of doing internships in law firms and accounting firms and going to gyms where they ride you know electric machines and stare out the window in an air conditioned room, to go spend time on a farm or a ranch and and you know learn to think, learn to be practical, get your hands dirty, get your feet dirty and get down into nature. And, and I, I think that especially with what's going on in the world today, young people would be so much better served than the way they're raised, being raised and in, in, in the environment they're in now. I, I'm going to sound like an old people here and echoing what old people say. I totally agree with you, Paul, on, on that. And the other thing that struck me, I haven't thought about this for a long time, but what you're saying is making me think back to when I when I went to grad school and then when I became a faculty member and working with some of the people. And two things. One that you mentioned, just the the ability to to innovate and work and solve problems and just do it, you know, and just know you can do it. I always thought I'm just taking the rancher approach, you know, which meant you're going to figure it out. <laughs> However it is, you figure it out. The other thing is the work ethic. Yes. So when I was on the ranch, it was it was six days a week, ten hour days, and it was like two fifty a month. So which you know, I mean, it was slave labor, but but you learn that you know you just learn a work ethic, right? You learn you learn and you learn. What was neat to me is you learn the value and the rewards that come from hard 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 work and hard physical work. It was uh, you know, and I think. Um, I'm thinking of something I was working on recently and this sort of hard times make make hard, tough, innovative people, which make soft times, which make soft, lazy, not so innovative people. How you go, go in cycles in societies. And uh, but I don't think it's just just old people kind of talk that we're doing here. I think there there's so much to to all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Fred, your research program focused on nutritional wisdom of the body, the nutritional wisdom of the body. Scientists and practitioners in food, nutrition, pharmaceutical, and the medical industries rarely ever talk about this topic, uh, nor do people in the general population know what it is. So what is nutritional wisdom, and do livestock and humans both, both possess this natural ability for nutritional wisdom? 
That's a wonderful place, I think, to launch into the conversation, Paul, and to set up a background that'll link link my experience in that with with the questions that you have. Um, you know, if you if you think about it, I mentioned my fascination with wild creatures. If you think about it, nobody has to tell a bacteria, wild insect, fish, bird, or mammal how to eat, how to develop, how to replicate. Um, they know how to do that, um, and the, how, how do they do that then is a question. The domestic animals, goat, sheep, and cattle that I you know, had no background of until I got on the ranch and came to, to be really fascinated with, you know, you look at them foraging and you may look at an old cow in the pasture and think that's a pretty easy life right out there in the green grass. <laughs> and there's not much, there can't be much going on here. A person asked me recently, do they have any intelligence, you know, and it was person didn't know about my background or anything. And I was nice and stuff, but you know what we got into, and this may sound like details, but it was, it became fascinating to me is that these animals are challenged to select diets from literally hundreds of different plant species. So imagine that you're out there on a landscape and you've got to forage for yourself. Like you're, you know, you you guys are pretty independent on your place. We were on the ranch and we try to be still now, but imagine you've got to do that um, like our ancestors did back in the day. Um, and you've got all these different grasses, forbs, shrubs, trees, each unique uh, phytochemically. Some of these species and plant parts are highly nutritious, but others are deadly toxic. Um, individual plants can be nutritious or toxic, depending on the time of day, the season of the year, um, and so forth, and the resources available in the environment. So it's really a moving, a moving target. Um, and yet, even with domestic animals, we came to find out and to really appreciate that they know what and what not to eat. Now, consider the irony. I, I think of this all the time. People have to be told by authority figures constantly what and what not to eat. So the question that I raised in nourishment was, have we lost the ability to identify and select nourishing diets? Or has that ability been hijacked? And if it has been hijacked, how did that happen? Yeah, that's for a very good investigation to dialogue about here. Yeah, and as we go along, I know we're going to get into that more and more. So let me let me say a few more words about this whole idea of nutritional wisdom to give the, the listeners just a little bit of sense of what that is. So the question is, how do animals... Uh, meat needs for nutrients and medicines. How do they self-medicate in the absence of nutritionists, pharmacists, medical doctors, and so forth? And I'm not, in anything I say, I'm not, not trying to berate any of those professions or anything like that. I'm just raising points of food for thought kinds of, of issues. So if you'll indulge me a minute, I'll tell you two stories here. Yeah, that please do. When I, when I got to graduate school, you know, my idea, so I was fascinated not only by, by wild creatures, but also as a result of my education at Colorado State University, became absolutely enthralled with plants, different plant species, and the diversity of different plant species. And I want to make points about that as we go along. Um, you know, we raise lawns and the extravagant use of resources. If we were to get back into native plants and the beauty of native plants, wild grasses, forbs, and shrubs, there's a lot to be said for that. We can come to that later on. But I, I became, you know, my mother had raised gardens while I was growing up, vegetable gardens. She loved flower gardens. So I wasn't, I had been exposed to that. But I had never really seen a plant until the sophomore year in college when I took plant taxonomy. And we had to go out and do a collection of plants. And it was just like this whole world. I couldn't believe I had to read two books just to learn how to identify plants, all their different parts of the plants and so forth. And uh, it just opened up a, a world to me I'd never seen. I often say, I'm digressing just a second, I'm coming back, but I often say, growing up, there were only three seasons for me, hunting, fishing, and skiing. And I survived <laughs> the end of one season only because the next season was, was coming around. 
So I got out of school that sophomore year, went back to work on the ranch, and I went to fish a, a small stream that I loved to stream, fish since I was a tiny kid. And I could no longer fish that stream because I was so enthralled by the plants that I'd never seen universes wow. that were there. And it, it struck me and still does to this day, how many universes don't we see uh, that are right there in front of us? But it, it was just alive. So anyway, what I would have liked to study in graduate school is wild goats, mountain goats, foraging on high elevation rangelands in the Rocky Mountains. That would have been my idea of a re ideal research project, is following them around, seeing what they're eating, trying to, to just do that. Well, I ended up with a project that was studying domestic goats down in southern Utah by a town called St. George, about 28 miles northwest of St. George in the mountains there. So I thought, what can be more boring than that? But there was funding for that <laughs> research project, you know. And the idea, the idea was what we mentioned earlier, was can we use domestic goats to prune this shrub black brush that grows in monocultures across huge areas of, of the transition zone between the cold and hot deserts? Um, can we use domestic goats to prune that shrub during the winter, stimulate new growth, new twigs grow in the spring, does that make sense? And these new twigs, people had done assays and they showed they're, they're higher in energy, protein, and minerals than the old woody twig growth. So we knew wildlife wintered on those landscapes and we thought we could use goats to improve those landscapes for mule deer, bighorn sheep, and for cattle that wintered in those areas. So that was the idea behind the project. Now, two stories that I want to tell about that whole business. The first is that what we quickly discovered um, as we got into the study was that given a choice, most goats, and I make a point of this, not all goats, but 80 to 90% of the goats didn't want anything to do with the new twigs on blackbrush. They very strongly preferred the old woody twigs. Hmm. When I told a toxicologist, an old toxicologist at Utah State about that, he looked at me and he said, I guess that just goes to prove that domestic animals have lost nutritional wisdom. Wow. And I, did, I didn't believe him, but I say that because that was, that was, the, that was the belief in, the, in those times, is that wild species still had it. But as a result of 10,000 years of domestication, domestic animals had lost that ability. So I didn't know what to say. I didn't believe him. But, um, but at that time, and this will lead into some of the questions that are coming up. up at that time, roughly, what, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, this whole area that I'll refer to as plant chemical ecology was just getting a start, where ecologists were starting to, to look at the diverse arrays of compounds that plants produce. You know, up to that time, people had focused on energy, protein, minerals, vitamins, and but there was this huge array of other compounds that plants produce. We don't need to get into the details on that in this podcast, I don't think, but they come under broad headings such as phenolics, which will be tens of thousands of those, terpenes, same thing, alkaloids, and so on and so forth. So this tremendous diversity. And years ago, people thought they were simply waste products of plant metabolism, in other words, sort of the urine and feces of plants. <laughs> well, it came at the time... That, that I got involved in all of this and the ecologists were getting involved, they were referred to as secondary compounds. And you're familiar with, familiar with that term and all of that sort of thing. So uh, Royal Lee calls them nutritional cofactors. Yes, yes. Another, yeah, another, uh, another way to talk about and think about them and important recognizing that they're, they, they, they play roles. So this whole field was, was burgeoning then. And we had this issue with the goats not wanting to eat the new twigs of black brush. And uh, I met some people at the University of Alaska, some ecologists, some plant herbivore ecologists like myself, as well as natural products chemists. And we got to talking and thinking, you know, this is probably being chemically mediated. And at that time, what people did was so-called bioassays. 
where you'd work with natural products chemists and you'd extract compounds from plants and then you'd put them on chow of what alfalfa pellets, let's just say, and you'd see whether or not those compounds deterred feeding by animals. And the chemists um, had really, I'd say, very nice procedures for, for thinking about how do we fractionate these plants and how do we make what can be incredibly challenging kind of uh, issue doable. So we started working with, with these chemists. We would harvest lots of black brush twigs, new twigs. It's great labor, actually, huge work to do that. And then we'd extract, grind, extract, purify compounds from them. And we'd done a bunch of, a series of bioassays with no, nothing deterring the goats. We finally came to one last compound, a particular condensed tannin that was in black brush. And the, our friend, the, the chemist said, you know, this is, this about got to be it. I don't know what else, what else is in this plant. So we did the feeding trial. I'll never forget. It was in the, the dead of winter. And uh, I'll say that this purified tannin was worth more than gold to us. It, it takes a lot of time to extract and purify. So we put this on the chow. We had 24 goats on the trial. Every goat ate every pellet. And we're thinking, you know, what the heck is going on with this deal? Our friend Tom Clausen tells us this is the only compound that's left in this plant that can be deterrent. And we probably spent an hour there after we, after we fed that, just trying to think what to do. And we said, well, the only thing we can do is take the tannin that's left and run one more trial tomorrow and see what happens. Ran the trial that next day, not a goat, ate a pellet. Interesting. That, that was a huge, huge, huge light bulb moment to us, a huge light bulb moment, because it taught us, one, that condensed tannin was deterrent. But much, much more importantly than that, the goats were learning to avoid the twigs. They didn't innately know. And that shifted. We published a major paper on that in a major journal. And that really was a wake up call for all of us people who'd been studying. Um, all these creatures and just assuming they innately, they simply by instinct do what they do. It was like, no, no, learning is probably really important. And I'll have to say that I made some friends in this in the world of psychology as a result of publishing that paper. One of them reviewed it, a fellow by the name of John Garcia. You know, back in those days, there were people like Paul Rosen and John Garcia who were absolutely legends in their fields for the research that they'd done, the lifetime of research. And John Garcia had studied learning in food selection, and Paul Rosen had been looking at those things too, but they'd done it with rats. And so most of their colleagues said, yeah, okay, that relates to a rat, but it's probably not really happening in the real world. So when we published this paper that validated a lot of the work that they they did. Uh, they were able to say, look, you know, here's here's a real live creature on a real live landscape, and it's, it's learning to select its food based on uh, aversive post-ingestive feedback, as we'll call that's a mouthful, but I'll talk just a bit more about that in a second here. Hi, everybody. Many people in the fitness world know me as the pioneer of the Swiss ball as a tool for resistance training and athletic conditioning. I introduced it back in 1988. At that time, I was working in an orthopedic physical therapy clinic in San Diego and discovered this large red ball covered with dust sitting in the corner. I asked the owner of the clinic what it was, and she told me it was for neurological rehabilitation, but nobody really knew how to use it. And that was just enough to intrigue me. So I did a lot of research on it, started using it myself, experimenting with it as a rehab tool and for athletic development. And what I discovered was that the Swiss ball is an incredibly flexible tool that could be used effectively with anyone from serious orthopedic and neurological injury cases all the way to the best athletes in the world. And you can rest assured I've tried it with all types of people, including many of the best athletes in the world. You can use it for isolation exercises, integration exercises, coordination exercises, strength training exercises, and even power development. 
You can use it to enhance balance, agility, stability, coordination, and posture. And you can use it throughout the entire conditioning process to take a client from rehabilitation all the way from injured right up to high levels of athletic performance. Athletes love the Swiss ball not only because it made rehabilitation interesting for them, but they often found themselves very challenged by even simple exercises, which was quite a mind blower for them. It was a point of pride for them to master these exercises. In fact, it wasn't long before they came back challenging me with the new exercises they've created. And so soon enough, people begin asking me, why am I just learning this now? Why is no one teaching these techniques? Why am I waiting till I'm injured to learn this stuff? That's when I created my first Swiss ball course, Swiss ball exercises for better abs, buns, and backs. But that course was created a long time ago and no longer exists. But I still believe the Swiss ball is one of the most important tools for any trainer or therapist to master. That's why I'm very excited to announce our brand new online course, The Czech Approach to Swiss Ball. The course is a culmination of 34 years of research and clinical experience using the Swiss Ball, and it will be your go-to course for how to use it for yourself and with your clients for maximum results. Remember when I said you could use the Swiss Ball for isolation, integration exercises, coordination exercises and strength training exercises, and to enhance balance, agility, stability, and posture, you'll learn how to do all that in the Czech approach to the Swiss ball. If you're not a believer in the Swiss ball like I am, you will be after this course, and your practice will be much better for it. This course takes a very scientific approach to the Swiss ball. So if you've experienced my scientific core conditioning or scientific back training programs, you know you're going to learn a lot, even if you've been using the Swiss ball for a long time or have already taken courses by other teachers. Best of all, we're releasing this brand new course on Black Friday, November 25th through 29th, where you'll all have the chance to get it at 30% off. So if you really want to master what is probably the most flexible, powerful tool you can take anywhere that any personal trainer or strength coach can have access to, mark your calendar and have fun learning, enhancing your fitness, and upgrading what you can offer your clients with the Czech Approach to Swiss Ball this November 25th at thechechshop.com. That's the C-H-E-K shop.com. I love this kind of stuff. I love it because not only are are we learning from it, but it describes the process of learning how to learn. You know, like the 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 previous guy said, oh, you know, maybe they've lost their feeding instincts or whatever. And you doubted it, but then you investigate, and instead of just going with old thinking. You try new methods and you find out new things. And, and I think that's what science is really for. And, and I think, unfortunately, uh, not to sidetrack the conversation, we don't have to go into it, but, you know, what, what's being given to us as science, especially through issues like COVID and all this, we, we really don't have a lot of science being given to us as science. And I I interviewed Irvin Laszlo and I said, you know, I'm really concerned that a lot of what's being promoted by science is not science and it's ruining science. And, you know, I said, look at all the drugs that were scientifically approved only to kill people. Look at vaccines that are scientifically validated that are now killing people. And the list is very long. And he said something pretty profound that I think you'll find interesting. He said, Paul, you need to make a distinction here. What you're talking about is not actually science. Science is the relentless pursuit of the truth. It's always an exploration and it's based on principles. He said, what you are talking about as scientists are not scientists, they're technologists that work for corporations that are pawned off to the public as scientists, but they're not actually doing science. They're doing research to prove what they want you to think to get you to buy something. And that's the problem. He said, People can't distinguish technologists that work for corporations from real scientists anymore. And that's where the problem is. So I love what you're describing because you're actually describing real science. You know, Paul, I know looking ahead to your other questions, um, there's going to be a great opportunity to, to build on the point you just made. I think that's a huge, huge, huge issue. And how how to get um, people understanding about that, the nuance of what's going on. That So let's come back to that as part of, of our discussion. I, I, 
I jotted down several notes and thoughts related to it, and I couldn't agree more with what you, what you just said and what what he was saying as well. I think that's true, and it, it, that raises that raises such so many huge issues that uh, we'll come to. I, if you follow those questions you sent me, we're going to come to them. Yeah, no, I, yeah, we'll go down I'll the look. list. I put a lot of notes down on that. Yeah, particular. good. I'm, that's why I'm excited. You know, I knew this was going to be an interesting conversation when I read your papers because your your work is very thorough and and it's very well balanced. It's not like you're trying to sell an agenda. It's like, okay, this guy's he's he knows how to think. <laughs> so I'm glad you're here. <laughs> yeah, so it's wonderful to be with you too. You know. I'm loving the conversation. It's taking me back to, to thoughts that I haven't had for a long time. I, I retired 13 years ago. But, um, you know, some of the people that I saw in science who did the most innovative work, and it goes back to what we were talking about, hands-on on the ranch and stuff, they were people who had spent a huge amount of time in nature because they were fascinated by it, observing carefully observing, just like that with the goats, you know, well, you're observing, you're observing what they're doing. And then it, you start to think and you're thinking about, well, what's going on here? And I don't know why for me, it's just, I gave the goats credit. Look, they can't be stupid. They can't be stupid. There's something going on here that we're not understanding. And what came out of that too, this whole field of chemical ecology, which I'm going to come back to, you know, at that time, what people were showing was that plants use those compounds as a way to protect themselves. Yes, defense and to chemical. protect new material. And so, you know, the, the plants were telling the goats, look, we don't want you fooling around with this new growth. It's a big <laughs> investment. Yeah. Literally, it's a big investment in these harsh, arid environments. So leave us alone, you know, or at best, don't take much of us. And the goats got the message. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was one part. Let me tell you one other story, and then I'll kind of sum up on this first question. There was another thing that happened. So my wife and I spent three months building fence in 110 degrees temperatures. This was ranch background, too, down there in southern Utah. It was, it was a tough, tough 10-hour days doing that. And what we did was we set up six pastures that varied in their size, two and a half acre, two, two and a half acre, two, five acre, and two, 10 acre pastures. Now those are details, but they tie in here. So we put the same number of goats, 15 goats on each one of those pastures. The first year we were running this study and we left, left them there for three months. And we were living with the goats, of course, down there on the place. Well, what happened was that in one of the two and a half acre pastures, the goats started to eat wood rat houses. Stunning, stunning to me to see that. So these wood rats are, are little rat, rat creatures, cute little creatures that live down there in the desert, make their living down there. And at the base of these trees, the juniper trees that were growing there, they build these big elaborate, elaborate houses. And the goats in this one pasture had started to eat those houses. So I started to investigate what was going on with that. And when you look at those houses inside, so they're covered with bark. Let's say the bark is a siding for their houses. And the goats had somehow figured to strip that bark away. And they're eating the house. Well, there's different rooms in those houses, literally. And one of the rooms is the bathroom. And that bathroom, the, the houses are made of vegetation, densely packed vegetation. So that becomes what it became was a non-protein nitrogen supplement for those goats. That urine soaked uh, vegetation was a source of nitrogen. And this links with soils and, and the whole business. So, you know, to maintain the gut microbiome in ruminants, they need a balance of protein and energy. and uh, other kinds of, of nutrients as well. But on blackbrush dominated rangelands, there's some energy in those twigs, but the protein content is quite low. So when they discovered this, this source of protein, they would, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a wood rat house left in their particular pasture, in that two and a half acre pasture. So when I did the, the statistical analyses on those, well, and looked at weight response of goats in the different pastures. 
the goats in the two and a half acre pastures lost significantly less weight during that three month browsing period compared with the goats in the five and 10 acre pastures. What was driving that whole response for those two and a half acre pastures, the two pastures though, was the goats in the one pasture that had learned to eat the wood rat houses. They hardly lost any weight during that winter trial. So that was significant, right? I mean, here's a, here's a deal where they'd figured out something and I often tease people. We, like I say, we were living with them out, day in, day out with them. I don't know why the particular goats in that pasture started to eat wood rat houses. I, I don't know how, you know, what I often tease people and say, well, the Einstein of the goat world was down there in that pasture and figured out that this is... But they're socialists can be. And so the minute that got started, they were all doing it. And uh, like I say, they ate every wood rat house in that pasture and they benefited from it. So just so I'm clear, it was, was it the nitrogen in the urine of the rats that was attracting them? Yes. And that nitrogen, you know, so they're... Peeing. It's the base of protein. Yes, that's it. It's a non-protein source of nitrogen. They're, they're urinating on that, uh, peeing on that densely soaked vegetation. So it becomes like a cake supplement, so to speak. You know? Yeah. So they're, 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 um, they've, they've got a chemist, a chemist mind in their head. They're smelling this and know that that's what they're needing. Yes. You know, what it fits with too, Paul, is, and, and we did a lot of research on this, is that when, when nutritional state is adequate, um, animals stick with what's familiar and they don't explore so much the, the unknown, un unfamiliar kinds of foods and so forth. But as nutritional state becomes inadequate, they start to sample highly unused. We may or may not get into this, but, you know, we, we had experiments where we were making uh, sheep, in this case, deficient in phosphorus, and they uh, they started to to eat soil, dig up soil and eat it. They started to eat feces of sheep that were adequate in phosphorus. So they start to sample new things. And if that works, bingo, you've got a preference formed very quickly. And um, so that, you know, I, from all the work we did, I think that's what was happening is that they were starting to explore the, and however they got going on those wood rat houses and then they sampled that and very quickly they were reinforced by the protein that was was in that uh, in the wood rat houses and immediately had a preference that led to them performing much better over that that uh, three month trial you, you know what that reminds me of which is a, sort of a different topic but it brings this whole concept up do you know what the Amanita muscaris mushroom is? Yes, I certainly do. I certainly do. <laughs> we were just in Colorado climbing 14,000 foot peaks and we were searching. We love mushrooms. We weren't searching for them on that day. But two weeks ago, two weeks ago yesterday, climbed a 14,000 foot peak over there. And yeah, I certainly do know Amanita muscaris. Yes. Well, the reason I bring that up is because the Tibetan shaman figured out that in order to get the best psychedelic effect, you have to eat the mushroom, pee it into a container and drink your urine, and then you get a much better psychedelic journey off of it. Yeah. So what, what, why I'm, you made me think of that is because, you know, they're with these animals all the time and animals might have been eating it. And for some reason, they might have drank the pee of one of the animals and gotten really high off of it. You know, you know, I think that's fascinating. I, I could see, Paul, we could probably, <laughs> we could talk for a long time. I can see. No. <laughs> so, you know, that, that raises that whole idea of innovation in animals, including humans. Huh? And how, how do animal, and that's what struck me so much. And throughout my career, looking for what occasions where animals innovate, where they figure something out. And then they're social, so it becomes a part of the culture. It becomes a part of the knowledge of the animals, just like in us. 
I have a friend who's originally from Boulder in Colorado who spent his life in Japan studying self-medication in animals. Yes, that's very interesting. I've got yeah. some books on that. Yeah, my, well, he may, he's probably cited in those. Michael Huffman is his Mike Huffman is his name, and what wonderful, wonderful fellow. We've we've been friends for many, many years now because we did a lot of work on self medication too. But he talks about he studied in in indigenous peoples and and so forth self medication and and talks about how they. Um, you know, how did they come up with some of the things like you're talking about on, on how, how do you figure out you take your Amanita mascara and then you drink tea? But he's been he's been with them, too. And just what you said, you know, they, they're close, intimate, intimate contact with animals and observing animals. What are they doing? And then thinking about that in relation to them. He's written papers about that and been on in the presence of uh, people that have have actually indigenous peoples that have made discoveries. It's an ongoing thing of, okay, this animal is sick. Uh, it's eating this plant. Perhaps that might be good for us as well. It's, it's a fascinating topic, I think. And so I very much appreciate what you're saying on that. Yes. You know, it's interesting too, in my library, I have a quite a comprehensive library I've been collecting for 40 years now. And, um, I've got a couple of books on um, psychedelics in insects and animals, and they pretty much have shown that every single insect or animal every studied, ever studied knows exactly what chemicals and which plants will get it high. And they, they use insects, they all, they know how to have a good time. They know how to alleviate stress. They all know what their medicinal herbs and plants are. I mean, you know, my point is, is there a lot of part of the problem is that people, even people with scientific backgrounds have got have developed a hubris where they think everything but human beings is unconscious and stupid, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, you, you, you know, are you familiar with Harry Hoxie? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've written about Harry. Yeah. I've written about Harry and, and his stallion. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, uh, the guy developed a cure for cancer by watching his sick horse, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, that, and, and I think that's, I mean, I think we've got to go back to observing nature because if we observe nature, we realize how precious it is. And Look, cutting the rainforest down at the rate they're cutting it down, I don't know what it is, thousands of hectares a day? Yes. Oh, it's alarming. I say to people all the time, I say, look, Rudolf Steiner warned, human life as we know it depends on two things, bees and trees. And he said, when they get to a critically low level, life will cease to exist as you know it. And we're the bee populations in many areas are 70% gone and the tree populations are almost gone. We got clear cut logging. We got the rainforest being cut down. And, and people think trees are just wood and, and, and everything's just an object. I mean, we've not only lost our connection to nature, but we have lost our reverence for life, our reverence for the integrated um, intimacy of the environment, of nature. And we've, we have got this concept that we're, unfortunately, a lot of this comes from the Bible that, oh, you know, we're, we're the shepherds and everything's here just for us. And this is why I like the Buddhist concept of the great chain of being, because we're not at the top of anything. You know, people forget our life depends on the little microorganisms that you walk on and can't even see. You oh, know, amen. amen to everything you're saying, Paul. We're kindred spirits. And as we go on in this conversation, I'll be, be echoing everything that you're. Yes, very well said. I I sure feel the same way. I, I think that. Um, We've forgotten that we're members of nature's communities. What we do to them, ultimately, we do to ourselves. Only by nurturing them, I often say, can we nurture ourselves? We, we've um, the hubris that you're talking about is uh, it's dangerous. Up with this too, as we'll explore as we go along here. I'm sure yes, I, I, I've yes, just agree with. All that you just said, I, I've gone that path very, very much as I've gone along. And I, I think that uh, 
we'll we'll be able to explore that more as we go. I'll leave I'll leave a couple of thoughts here. Yeah, this. that's cool. Well, we'll we'll keep rocking. Let let me say I'll 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 sum up now. Let me sum up a little bit. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Go of what you're saying, of what I, I'm, of what I'm saying, and where where this whole business took me. So, so those goats knew what they were doing, no question about it. Um, it was a kind of of lack of understanding and appreciation for the this wisdom of the body that hasn't been lost from domestic animals or from human beings either. It's too fundamental to to the way that. To survival, to to be lost, but I think it has been hijacked, definitely in people, and also in in livestock in ways that people don't appreciate. This will wind us back as we go on to the fact, you know, to to meat and meat and dairy and the quality of that, and and the importance of of diversity of different plant species in the diets of animals for the health of animals. But then for for the the meat and dairy that comes from that, and I say that too, I'm going to sound disjointed here a second, but I want to tie back with what you said. You know, this idea of reverence for life, and uh, I'm going to explore this from a plant standpoint, that, that plants are, are conscious, one could argue they're sentient, and all the senses they have, and they're amazing. And so... A lot of times nowadays you see the debates over should you eat plants only, should you eat animals only, and, and so forth and so on. To me, I often think what we need is this uh, this appreciation that all life is sacred. Yes, it is. That all life is sacred, and, and that uh, eating is participating in, in something in a very sacred kind of act. And, uh, you know, and again, going back to the ranch in those kind of days, what, when you when you slaughter your own animals and you you prepare meat and you and you thank the animal you thank the thank the plants ah, i have a prayer i like to say that people like me to say but it, it acknowledges that we th- thank the give thanks to the plants and animals who daily give their lives to sustain our lives through meals prepared with love and so forth but you know it's that recognition um and then that the you know that that we're a part of all that. We're not separate from that. We're a part of that. I often tell my wife Sue, "I hope that I I I die when I'm out hiking one of these remote places and that nobody finds me for a long time. So let the let the coyotes and the, and the foxes, and, you know, that that's a natural process, right? This body is ephemeral. That's a natural process. Let them." I may be too toxic going to one of your tables and there may be too toxic. To no, I, I think you'll be okay. But I, I, it's funny you say that because I said to I have two wives, Angie and Penny. And I said, if, when I die, bury me in the garden or bury me underneath a tree or plant a tree inside the soil so that I can let my body permeate the whole yard and feed everything around here. Right. Because I, I want it to be useful, you know, because I want to give back. But I, I can I interject? I want you to share your prayer. I want to share mine with you. What's okay, your, go. Oh, you want me to? What's your prayer for your food? Well, I, I say with with awe and humility, give thanks for our moment on earth with all its horrors, beauties, wonders, deep mysteries. We're grateful for family and friends who accompany us on this journey. We give thanks for the plants and animals who grace this planet, who daily give their lives to sustain our lives through meals like this prepared with love. Bless us in this planet for the greater good, whatever that may be, however limited our ability to fathom that. That's great. I say thank you, dear food, for the love you are giving me now, for the love you have given Mother Earth and Mother Universe. It is with great love and respect that I bring you into my being. I invite you to join me so that together we can make the world a better place for all living beings now and in the future. Om, peace, amen. Wonderful, wonderful. Because I, my philosophy is I'm not killing the food. It's now becoming human, and I'm inviting it to join me so that I can use the wisdom and the intelligence and the energy and the resources it's bringing me 
to use my life to help make the world a better place for all living beings. And, and, and this is what I try to get to the vegetarians. I say, look, you, you know, this idea of killing meat, you don't, you're, you're disconnected from the spirit. If there was no spirit in that food, it would just be like eating rocks. You're bringing the life force, the soul, the presence of that plant into you, and it's supporting you. So the chicken's not dying. The chicken's becoming human. You know, and, and then I, I say, you know, Rudolf, Rudolf Steiner said something very important. He says, it's okay to kill something as long as you're going to do something better with it. But if you're just going to chop trees down and build another shitty shopping mall, that's killing. Right, right. There's you know? a distinction to be made there. A distinction to be made there. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and this idea <clears throat> that we can come to more as we go along, too, of, of, of transformation, unending transformation. Huh? Everything that's transitory is but an illusion and everything's transitory. huh? It's forever transforming. Trans and we're a part of that. And then that broader notion... <clears throat> of enlightenment or at oneness with being, huh? Of that that it's one, it's it's one, it's ultimately one thing, at oneness with with the transcendent, which again I wrote a couple of notes down as we go along, actually. Your questions stimulated me to 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 maybe add a few thoughts related to that. Yeah, that that Buddhist notion, huh? Of at oneness. I think, too, I don't know where it came from, but it's inside of me, the saying, being is becoming. Yes. Yeah. Right? We're not just here being. Even rocks are becoming, right? Right. Everything. And I think people have lost sight of becoming and, and that every day you have a chance to learn more about life, about love, about yourself, about nature. and to become something more that you can share with all of it, you know? But what do we have now? A world full of people that are addicted to video games, junk food, and they see no purpose in life. And, I'm, and I, I look at this and I go, look, you need to spend some time on a farm. You need to go contribute to something. You need to go do something where you get to help other people become something too. And I, I watch this all going down and, and I'm I'm like, wow, I've really got I've really got to make sure my children because I, I have a 43 year old, my first son's 43 and he has a grandson. So I have I have a grandson from him. And then when I was 54, Angie had Mana. And then when I was 56, Zoe came along. So I've got a six year old, a three year old, a 43 year old and a grandson. But I'm looking <laughs> at my, you know, my first son, he's well grounded. He, you know, he knows how to take care of himself and he's super intelligent. So I'm looking at my 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 three year old daughter and my six year old boy, and I'm like, you know, they're going to see more radical shit in the next ten years than I saw in my entire lifetime. Amen to and, that. And, and and I've got to anchor these kids in the soil and in what life is all about because people are going to try to mess their heads up, eject them, brainwash them. Like I look at what what the kids are are living in today and it's it's they're so disconnected even from their biological roots can you imagine not having the knowledge you and i have and being a 6 or an 8 year old kid living in a city today living off of microwave shit and and sugar water and all the medical crap. I mean, it, you know, wonder the world's falling apart. You know, it's it's unbelievable. That's right. And you're truly at the mercy of the medical, pharmaceutical, and so forth kind of industries, right? When you're well, cartel would be a better word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. A amen to to all of that. I'm sure most of you are aware, even though you may not like the taste of organs, that organ meats are extremely important and good for you. And I've got great news for you. Paleo Valley makes an amazing grass-fed organ complex that's unique and better than anything I've ever found out there. So much better. I wanted you to hear right from Autumn Smith, its creator, exactly what you're going to get from their grass-fed organ complex. Autumn, get us informed on why we should be using your amazing organ complex. 
Okay. Well, like you said, organ meats are nature's multivitamins. And when we use them, we feel this energy and this stamina. And most people don't like the flavor. So what we did was we took grass-fed and finished organs like liver and heart and kidney, and we just put them into capsules so that you can get all the benefits, the beautiful benefits of organ meats without actually having to taste them, without liver burps, of course. And they're just freeze-dried. So again, they're not processed heavily in any way whatsoever, and they are sourced from American farmers using regenerative agricultural practices. And all you have to do to try it out is go to our website at paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15, and that's lowercase C-H-E-K-15. And I sincerely hope you love it. I'll, I'll just sum up here a second. Yeah. On, on the nutritional wisdom part. And I love the digressions. For me, it's perfect, you know. To... Well, I, I say my podcast is, is as much dialogue as interview. And I put all these things together. I do a bunch of research, but half the time I end up having conversations like this. But I think I think what spirit's bringing out of us is, is important. And, and I'm yeah. happy to do 100 podcasts with you, Fred. <laughs> No, and it's 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 in the moment, right? And it, it's just coming from the heart, and, and that's yeah, that's that's fabulous. Already, we've at least from from my standpoint, we've touched on some really meaningful, you know, bottom line kind of things. It is. I, it came to mind, and that's where we. Could go. I really, uh, I really came to admire a fellow named Joseph Campbell. You may or may oh, not. Oh, I've know. studied him my whole. Life. <laughs> he's, he's an amazing guy. But what you were saying earlier made me think of something. He said, person, uh, person nowadays, given a choice between going to heaven or watching a video on heaven, he'd watch the video. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's too good. You know, he, he died in 1986, roughly. Think, think how much has happened since then. Oh, my God. He would, he would probably be just shocked at what's going on now. Yeah, he wouldn't. You know, and, and the virtual, this virtual, yeah, and I don't know, I I often think the same thing you do, that that contact with nature and that, that farming business. I'm so pleased to hear that you had that experience and so fortunate myself that, that I had that because it's so grounding and centering. I remember those years in college on the ranch where I'd be out irrigating and, uh, you know, out, out in the fields and stuff, I never felt so grounded and centered. And the seasonal kinds of things that occurred in the spring, the the activities, the planting in the summer, the growing and, and the harvesting and in the fall. and But it just felt, I wish I could put it into words that would get people to, re it was so amazingly grounding and centering being there in, in nature, working hard like that. And I used to often think about the ants that were on the ranch. And I thought, you know, obviously I don't know how you experiencing the world, but I feel like I'm one of you. Yeah. Right when I see you doing your seasonal things and, and then in the winter, we would would feed hay to the cattle. It was just, um, and so I didn't need to, you know, I would ne never have have invented cell phones. I often thought that I'd have never got into videos I'd ne because life was the video, life being out there and doing that. And there was always, then as you said, and not to beat this to death, but you know, when you're out on a place and you're responsible and your father says in your case or in Henry's case, he's just, he, you know, it's just up to you to get it done. Figure it out. Figure it out. It's amazing because that gives you your head for one. You're not not being told by people. He's not telling you do this and this and this. He's saying, go do it. Get it done. It's amazing how much innovation and uh, that stimulates, but also how fun that is, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, wow. It's There's always a challenge. You don't know where it's going to come from next, but there's always going to be some really neat challenge, and you rise to the occasion. And there's a great sense of accomplishment, too, especially because usually when you've got a challenge, it's stopping you from uh, harvesting or it's stopping you from, uh, you know, 
it's stopping the, the function of something that has to happen, whether it be keeping an animal contained where it needs to be, or the, the hay baler's got to work, or you're not going to get your hay in, or the rain's coming and you better get it, your hay off the fields. Or, in other words, so there's a sense of legitimate accomplishment. It's, it's not like you, you, you um, did another 10 push ups, big deal. It's more like, you're part of a process and you can have a sense of self-reflection and say, wow, I'm really glad I figured it out. And oftentimes that I'm glad I figured it out becomes now I know what to do next time. And I know how to teach somebody else what to do. Absolutely the case. And there's a confidence that gets developed in that. It's not necessarily an arrogance at all, but there's just a confidence that, you know, <laughs> there's really nothing can stop me. I, I don't know how, I don't mean that in an arrogant way, but that's carried throughout my whole life. Whatever it was, we'll just do it. We'll just figure it out. We'll just get it done. And uh, that's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So to sum up on this nutritional wisdom part of our, of our conversation, then, um, <clears throat> so what we, so the goats in the wood rat houses and, and them figuring that out, there's another, another thing thing here that was amazing to me. Out of 18 different groups of goats, let's say, that were on those pastures, over, over the winters that we did that, that was the only group of goats that ever figured that out. That's pretty amazing. So it means that it's not inevitable that animals will figure things out, right? Mm -hmm. that, but sometimes it happens. For whatever reason, it happens. And then this notion of culture becomes really important in that. So let me say, to sum up, I, I would say that a palette in harmony with the landscape evolves from three mutually interrelated processes. The foundation that we studied so much over 35 years is these metabolically mediated, what we call flavor feedback relationships that involve cells and organ systems of the body, including the microbiome, interacting with biochemicals in foods. Um, and those relationships then are mediated, as we came to learn, by nerves, neurotransmitters, peptides, hormones, and so forth. And that becomes then the basis for the nutritional wisdom of the body. For instance, ju just very, very quickly, no need to go into the details, but if you look at where nerves from the gastrointestinal tract, like the vagus go, they go to the brain stem and they converge directly with nerves for taste. They're talking to one another. So this is setting up this, this feedback. So that we did so many studies of that, Paul. And to make a, a long story really short, but we showed that whether it's energy or protein or ratios of protein to energy or rates at which protein and energy ferment relative to one another, or minerals like sodium, phosphorus, calcium, vitamins, and so forth, that all those kind of relationships were being mediated by feedback. They were learning. Animals were learning, and they learned very, very quickly. But you think, well, why? see, they'd always been assumed that they just innately know, they innately know. But if you think, think about it, here's me, me trying to reflect for whatever that's worth in this sense, but in environments that are constantly changing within a day, from day to day, week to week, season to season, and then that are changing hugely over thousands of years, it makes sense to set up a system where animals are able to learn very quickly. You don't just lock into something. You create an ability to learn very quickly. And these feedbacks are, are really uh, vital in that. The second part then that we'll come to more in the podcast and this hijacking, what really matters for animals is the availability of a rich array of, of phytochemically rich foods. They can't do it on a monoculture or a total mixed ration in a feedlot. It's not going to happen because they don't have choices available to them. The third part then is this cultural part. And, and we did so much studies looking at how starting in utero, um, then the, the fetal taste system's fully functional during the last trimester of gestation. And we show that flavors in foods mom eats gets into the amniotic fluid. It's already preparing the offspring to eat foods that are out there in the environment. 
After birth, flavors get into mother's milk and a rich array of flavors. Now let's contrast that. I'm jumping ahead, but let's contrast that. Imagine nowadays a mother feeding her infant on formula. Oh my you know, God. On a healthy processed diet, then you feed them on formula. There's no, it's just broken those links so so completely compared to say a mother that's eating, let's contra a mother eating a really wholesome diet of plant and animal foods, whatever, eating a rich array of those, her offspring starting to get that in, in the amniotic fluid in utero, which is influencing gene expression, that it's influencing morphology and physiology. Um, then when mother's diet uh, ha is varying from meal to meal and day to day, and she's breastfeeding her, her baby, all those flavors, that baby's being exposed to this really rich array of flavors. That's setting them on a totally different trajectory. And then mother as a model, you know, mother, uh, we showed over and over again, young animals are learning what and what not to eat, where and where not, not where and where not to go to forage, um, what's a predator, what's not a predator, all these things the young animal is learning from mother. Does that mean that the young animal never does anything differently? No, absolutely not. Young animals are inquisitive, right? They're exploring as well. But what mom has done is to set them up with this familiar base of foods. Now imagine that a young animal samples something that's never eaten before and it gets sick. And we did studies like this. It gets sick immediately after that, bam. It's like, whoa, no wonder mother, I'm <laughs> no wonder mother avoids this stuff. It's bad. But the young animal samples it really cautiously. It doesn't go and eat two pounds of it. It takes a few bites and it, uh, it looks at what the consequences are. And again, we showed that in studies after studies after studies, this relationship between the familiar novel dichotomy, mother's role in all of these sorts of things as well. So if I was giving a talk now and and laying this out in a in a uh, in that fat format, I would show you a video of sheep. And I, it, there are two group there would be two groups of sheep in separate pens adjacent to one another, four sheep in each pen. And they would be eating straw. And as you know, straw is not a great forage, right? I mean, it's... No, it's, it's pretty malnourished. It's not very much yeah, nutrition. Yeah, it's not going to be... It's not a great food. So, but one group of sheep, <clears throat> both groups of sheep have been made mildly deficient in a nutrient. And we did this in short courses that we taught for years and years. So this video came from a short course. And... Uh, and so the one group, after immediately after they ate the straw, we put the nutrient they were lacking directly into their gut. We just put it right into the gut. Doesn't matter how we did that. That's not important, but we put it. The other group got the carrier, but not the nutrient. So what you would see then in this short video is one group of sheep absolutely loves the straw. They, they eat every morning. They're chowing it down like mad. The other group of sheep, isn't eating at all. In fact, they're standing there at the panel that's separating the pens, looking at the other sheep like, what have you got that we don't have? So, yeah. so it's just, it's a powerful way to show what we were seeing over and over again when we, when we ran those, when we ran those, those studies. And, and, you know, we didn't, we obviously didn't know this a priori. We were learning as we went and we were, all the scientists or we were publishing our papers were learning as we went too and showing at these conferences but it was stunning to us that whole business of feedback just when we did that study that time that I mentioned with the goats and they avoided the the new twigs after or they avoided the the tannin rich chow that really I thought about that for a long time and, and it, because it was so foreign, you know, everybody thinks you eat something, you eat things because they taste good. You avoid things because they taste bad. This whole idea that feedback was mediating these relationships was not a part of the, on the radar screen at all. And so I'm just trying to emphasize how much that struck me. And then we just did, well, 
you know, hundreds of studies showing all the different ways that works with different nutrients, the nuance and all that stuff. So let me make another point here. Uh, and then we'll, we'll, uh, and I want to make a point about the microbiome, which is very important. No question about that. But I want to say for as long as I've been involved in ruminant research, the gut microbiome has been the the alpha and omega. It's been what everybody uh, focused on. You know, that that whole area of ruminant nutrition, it's like all there is is a rumen here. That's all that matters. And it's important, no question about it. And the microbiome and what's going on there is, is vitally important. But <clears throat> the point I want to make is that the rumen is just one of many organ systems in the body. And all these organ systems are, you know, people are showing with humans now, well, the gut microbiome is producing uh, peptides, transmitters, neurotransmitters that are altering liking for food. And yes, yeah, certainly. But I want to make the point that the other organ systems of the body are also playing a role in that. They each have different needs, right? Central nervous system, yeah. from muscles from. And I, I'll close with the, with a story that makes that that come come so alive. And it's, it's based on a memoir written by a lady named Claire Sylvia, and it's titled A Change of Heart. Claire was one of the first people ever to receive an organ transplant. She got a transplant of a heart, heart and lungs, actually. <clears throat> and uh, this book is her account of that. And what she, what she points out is, um, you know, there, how do I say she points out that everything in her life changed when those organs were put into her body. Yeah, I'm very familiar with this, but I'm glad you're sharing it. Yes, emotionally and physically, it's like, and, you know, a doctor told her, the heart's just a damn pump. But if you think the heart is just a damn pump, she's telling him, put somebody else's heart in your body and you'll see it's not just a damn pump. It brings a lot of, a lot of information with it. And so Claire got the, the heart and lungs of a 20-year young man put into her 48-year-old female body. And so that book is just an account, an amazing account of, of how that changed. But the point that she made was that her preferences for foods really broadened out after she got Tim's heart and lungs. She never liked for, well, she never liked beer. She never liked green peppers. She never liked chicken McNuggets, on and on and on. And she came to just absolutely love those. In fact, um, when she was about to be released from the hospital, she was on an exercise bike. The press was there to interview her because it was big news, right? In those days, that was big news. And at the end of the interview, one of the reporters said, you know, if you could have anything you want right now to eat or drink, what would you want? She said, Actually, I'd like a beer. And she said the minute the words came out of her mouth, she wished she could take them back for two reasons. One, it was a flippant response to a serious question. Two, I don't even like beer, she said. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's just trying to make come alive that these cells and organ systems in our bodies are, you know, who is this entity I call, quote, me? It's this whole gestalt. It's not just. It's a fact, collection. The central nervous system gets in the way a lot of times of, of, of the knowledge, the physical and spiritual knowledge. You know, like the enlightened ones say, you've got to shut down all that chatter and you wake up to who you who you really are. Right. You become. It yes. It, they're, they're all giving instinctual wisdom. Yes. Yes. So that's kind of that that's trying to say it just to try try to make that point and to highlight some of the things that we were learning o along the way about this nutritional wisdom of the body and uh, and the book nourishment was my attempt so we published probably 250 papers now it's over 300 in the scientific literature on these topics but no one's going to read all those papers and so nourishment was my attempt to 
to try to pull it all together and, and give lots of references for people who might be skeptical or who want to read more, Nourishment was my attempt to, to put that into one place and try to say, here's the big picture on it. And I, I tried my best to not, I don't know what's the right word. I don't want to say dumb it down, but to make it in a way that, that was, was more readily understandable than all these scientific papers. But I realized visiting with many people and uh, that there's still a tremendous amount of information in that book, that it, it's dense. It's very, very dense book to read. I was asked to give a, uh, a talk for the Nature Conservancy, the advisory board for the Nature Conservancy in October next month. And they, they want me to summarize a lot of what you and I will be talking about for, for, to get their people more knowledgeable about it. And the guy that asked me said, I started rereading your book. And he said, it just strikes me again how much, how much, how dense the information is in there. So um, I guess that's neither here nor there. But it was an attempt to, to pull all that information on, on these, what I've just touched on here, into one place where people... I think it's important. It. They wanted to have a look. Is that the book you've been putting on audio? Yes. I can't wait for that. You know, I don't have time to read a lot because I'm in the middle of writing a huge book myself, but I can listen to that while I exercise. Well, that that's great. And you know, what I tried to do in that too, so nourishment was about 154,000 words in length. I cut it down to about 82,000 words and tried to, to, to remove a lot of the scientific de detail and stick to the big picture of it. So yeah, so that's, you know, that should be coming out in the next, I don't know how long it takes, but we, we finished, we finished all the work on the audio book yesterday, all the, all the redos. And so please, please let me know when it's out. Cause when I want to get a copy and two, I'll notify all my students and, and, and I'll try to get as many people as I can to listen to the audio book or read the book. Okay, well, thank you very much, Paul. That that's good. Uh, it's so much what we're talking about. So it re reinforces from a physical and a spiritual standpoint all the that we're talking about. That's what the the book, what the the audio book. And then I was visiting with a person as we hiked this fourteen thousand foot peak on the way down. I was one of the people that went was very heavily involved in the medical profession and very very much interested and open to what you and I are talking about. And she said, you know, um, will you send me a copy of your book or, or whatever? And I said, you know, maybe the place to start is to listen to the audio book. And if you find that really interesting and engaging, then you can go to the written book and you can really get into, into much more detail than's in the audio book. So I will let you know, though, and I appreciate I appreciate uh, that you'll help spread spread the word on on all that business. Well, I honestly think it's a matter of survival at this point. You know, I uh, for reasons we'll get into as we go along in this conversation, and I'm not an alarmist type. I don't like to to be a fear monger or anything else. But all that's happening ecologically, economically, socially, politically nowadays, I think. Uh, I think it's very, very important to to use this as food for thought. What you're involved in, all that you've been trying to do and promote, and then uh, what certainly I've been involved in, and what's in that book. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the show. I imagine you know that magnesium is one of the minerals that people in North America are the most efficient in, but it's an extremely important mineral to have in your diet regularly. And believe it or not, Bioptimizers has improved what was already well known to be the best magnesium formula out there called Magnesium Breakthrough. So I've got Wade Lightheart with me to explain what it is they've done to improve this already excellent formula. Wade, what is new about your new Mag Breakthrough formula? Well, it's called sucrosomial magnesium. So we have seven different types of magnesium in magnesium breakthrough because they're uptaken by different parts of the body. But a new type of magnesium has been created called sucrosomial. And what it shows in the research and science is that it's actually even more absorbable by the body, particularly inside of the brain, which is a big aspect uh, to enhance neurotransmitter formation as well as ensuring the 
rest and relax response in the nervous system that a lot of people will take magnesium for. They find it, you know, clocks them down, helps them sleep better, allows for the relaxation of striated and smooth muscle tissue in the body, which creates an energetic relief. And so when we added sucrosomial, we were able to demonstrate inside our lab facility that we were able to get better improvements. Of course, we have a partnership with the Birch International University. We have some patents we're working on, uh, which will kind of relay some of these things. But sucrosomial was a no-brainer when we added to the formula, improved the results or improved the uptake. And the reports back from our testing team were like, wow, this we get more results with less caps. And that's always the goal for our company. That's excellent. I love it. I, I always say, and people have probably heard me say it before, I just am so amazed how you guys are constantly and always improving and working your best to not only make better products for us, but it doesn't seem to me that it gets more expensive as you make them better. So that's a real gift to the world. Thank you. Where can people get their new magnesium breakthrough formula? All you need to do is go to www.magbreakthrough.com slash living4d. Put in Paul 10, get 10% discount on your first bottle. And of course, if you order multiple bottles, you can get an extensive discount on that as well. And like everything else we sell, 365 day money back guarantee. If this isn't the best magnesium you've ever taken in your life, we demand that you tell us and we can give you your money back. But I think you're probably going to demand, hey, can I get more of this? <laughs> that, that's probably more the truth. So that's mag, M-A-G, breakthrough.com forward slash living number four. And then the letter D, code Paul 10. Enjoy deeper relaxation and better nutrition with mag breakthrough. You, you know, before we move to my next point of discussion, I want to loop back to something you talked about with with the uh, goats knowing, for example, when the tannins were too much and they didn't want to eat them and, and the goats eating the rat houses. And I've studied a lot of animal feeding studies, you know, and, and one of the books that I first studied you know, a long time ago was... Um, the Living Soil and the Holly Experiment by Lady Eve Balfour. Yes. Which, you know, she talks all about. There's testing of the foods with the animals to see if they could identify which one was organic, which one was grew with uh, uh, NPK fertilizers or chemical fertilizers, uh, which ones were grown with animal fertilizer, and which ones were grown just with nothing. And they always could tell. And um, so here's the point um, that I want to, put on the table because I think this is I want to help people see something it's clear that animals know what they need and if they're left to nature they'll go find it just like Hoxie's horse absolutely so now I'm going to post a, a, a statement that's something that I want to hear your response to imagine what's happening to the billions of cows and pigs and chickens raised in corporate farming environments where they're fed a very, very narrow diet, mostly of stuff they're not even designed to eat, that at the level of their brainstem, we have our reptilian reflexes. Am I safe? Can I eat? And if I'm safe and I've eaten, I can procreate. So we've got these reptilian reflexes right in us. We've got the mammalian nervous system in us. So everything that you're talking about is built into our brain. So imagine that the animal itself must be developing a level of fear and anxiety as it day by day becomes more and more malnourished and senses that it's dying. Paul, let, let's take a minute since you raised, I think that's such a critical issue. And I thought about that quite a lot as we were doing studies on this whole area of nutritional wisdom over the years. I never wrote about it much. I have a bunch since I've retired trying to make points. So let's, let, let's just step back from this whole deal. And it becomes, you're right, it beca the, the, the five animal welfare freedoms all get tied in and all, all get, uh, I'll get abused in that. Let's let's just step back and and think about this. So you've got an animal in a natural situation. It's conceived, born, and reared in a particular landscape, and mother becomes a transgenerational link to that landscape and the ancestors and so forth. Uh, that becomes very functional kind of linkage. 
So what, what we do now then, and, you know, the emotional aspect of all this, mother, mother is very, what happens in, in many of the, an, the wild animals like we were interested in and worked with, let's take bison, for instance, or, or elephants or, or many, many ungulates, they, they live in extended families. They're living in families, matrilines. Um, and if you let goat, sheep, and cattle go feral, they end up in extended families and matrilines as well. It's amazing. It's an amazing thing, but it's an amazing, how do we say this? Just like for we humans, family can be a great source of knowledge and comfort and uh, stability and health and health to us. It, it definitely is to them. It's amazing. So what we've done, though, is we take these young animals then at a few months of age, six months, whatever it is, we wean them from mother. We send them to a feedlot somewhere. Totally unfamiliar environment, totally unfamiliar peers now. They're social. They know one another. They have buddies. They have. So imagine the amount of stress. And we've measured that. We've measured that in animals. So you've got this huge stress now. We put them on a total mixed ration formulated for the, quote, average individual. And again, I'm not, you know, I, I worked with people in animal science my, my whole career and stuff and had great admiration. So I'm not trying to be, to throw, to, to be derogatory in that sense. But I, I'm, uh, it's important points for all of us to think about. So we formulate this total mixed ration for the average individual. And it's a point I want, I want to make as part of this. No two individuals are alike on this planet. They never have been. They never will be. You have genes being expressed in ever-changing environments. And then to keep things interesting, nature adds a pinch of chance. And so, you know, a ton has been studied and written. Chance bubbling up from the quantum level to the molecular level during development. So, no two individuals are alike. They never have been, which is amazing to think about that, actually. You know, it, it puts you in awe and reverence for that. I, I say God is a novelty generator. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. God is a novelty. And you just got to appreciate that. So, so that means that some individuals are going to be overfed on that total mixed ration. Some are going to be underfed on that total mixed ration. No individual is going to be probably exactly fed on that ration. Um, let me make one other point about that. We, this could be endless digress, but it, since you raised it, I'm going, we did studies with sheep and cattle both where we took, we worked with, with animal nutritionist, good friend, and we said, okay, formulate a total mixed ration to finish these animals on, and then we'll slaughter them and we'll see how they perform. And we'll feed one group of animals the total mixed ration. The other group of animals will give a choice of the ingredients that went into making that total mixed ration. Even depauperate as it is, we'll still give them a choice of corn and barley and alfalfa and corn silage and so forth. We'll give them a choice of the ingredients. That, the, that study with cattle was so, so interesting. So we looked at how much the animals ate. and. Uh, the group that was offered a choice ate significantly less food than the animals fed the total mixed ration. And what we figure is that those animals on the total mixed ration, this relates to, to humans, were over ingesting energy to meet needs for protein. Their protein needs for a lot of them weren't being met. So how do you do it? You over ingest energy to end up with your meat. So there, there's an inefficiency. There's a cost, right? If we want to put it just in a capitalistic sense, there's a cost involved in that because the one group's eating far more food. The second thing was that when we looked at, at let's take protein to energy ratios of those animals, and we averaged the group that was given the choice, their line fell exactly on top of the line, I don't know if this makes sense, of the animals fed the total mixed ration. They were on average doing what the animals in the total mixed ration were doing, but there was no average animal. Some were above the line, some were below the line. Nobody ate the ratio of energy to protein. 
No two individuals ate the same food from day to No two individuals ever ate the same combination of those foods. No individual ever ate the same food from day to day. And that's with only a handful of choices. Then when we looked at, at once we'd slaughtered them, they, you know, for people who know about the grading systems, they graded the same. So, um, so there's this whole whole business then of the of the average individual. That's the next the point. A next point I want to make, and this was studies we did that really caught my attention. These total mixed rations are very high in grain, and it goes to the point that you made. Animals will eat some some um, some some of the seeds of plants in the fall, but it's not a it's not a high grain ration that they're on at all when they're doing that. So we were doing studies to try to better understand how are animals experiencing toxins in plants, and it, they were simplistic. I know we we really don't have a clue of all this, but. One of the things we were doing, we were saying, does it make them feel nauseated? You know, do they get nauseated when they do that? And so we were showing that if we gave animals antiemetic drugs prior to the time that they were, were eating a, a toxin-containing food, they'd actually eat more of that food, which is not something you'd want to do, right? But it's just showing that we're knocking out a feedback system that allows them to sense that. But the same thing was true on high grain rations. They ate far more high grain ration when they were on antiemetic drugs. What's that tell you? They're sick. Those high grain rations make them feel sick. And so you get these sickly patterns where they'll eat and then they drop off and then they eat some and then they drop off. So that's another problem with that whole deal. The, the last that I'll mention um, is imagine that somebody formulated in a way the the ultra processed food industry has done that they formulated total mixed rations for humans that are that's high, right yeah are very high in 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 high fructose corn so energy sources and so forth but imagine that someone formulated a ration for you and they and that's all you could eat day in day out every meal that's all you ate it doesn't take any time to show in studies how sick and tired animals get of trying to do that. And we would be the same thing. You couldn't stand it. You could not stand that food. And yet that's what they've got to deal with. So, you know, I, 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 I wasn't, goes back to something you said. I was never involved in trying to make money off of our research, anything like that during the years that I was doing, doing the work. And it was a blessing, actually. It was a blessing not to be involved in any of any of because the motivations were pure in that sense. Right. I yes. went to many conferences over the years where there'd be everything from people studying rats to people like me studying ruminants to people studying people. And we were all talking about the same principles and processes. We all understood how behavior works. But I used to think, and the guys from the food industry would give their talks and talk about how they were going to create the next product and so forth. And I used to, to think, boy, that's that's pretty clever how they're doing that. It's really, I wasn't using the word then, but it's a great way to hijack the system. And I used to think all the time, I used to think, you know, nobody really cares about a goat, a sheep, or a cow, but where the money is, is with people. If you want to make money, that's where you take these understanding of these principles and processes, and you, you use it on the, the human food system. Well, now, as you're advocating, and me too, We've got to we've got to unhijack the system and get back to growing and eating wholesome foods, and get the palate um, back in touch. With two things have happened, you know, and we can get into this more as we go. the The flavors of wholesome foods, whether it's fruits, vegetables, um, meat products, dairy have gotten blander and blander and blander. At the same time, ultra-processed foods have become irresistible. They've figured out how to do that. And so it's a double whammy that's really set us up for, talk about a, a super hijacking of, and then we just have to look around and we see the, the obesity and diet-related diseases. And uh, that's a 
fact, as we, we all know, huh? Yeah. See, what what I was leaning towards, and, and I'll just take this one step further before we move on, because I think it's very important, and I've seen many, many cases of this in my career. Take what we just talked about with the animals, their sensitivity to nutrients, their awareness that they know what they need. You broke the ingredients up. They knew exactly what they need. Every animal ate differently. Whereas the people that ate, the animals that ate the mixed ration had no choice. Now, we have those instincts inside of us, whether our ego consciousness is aware of it or not, our liver's aware of it, our kidneys are aware of it, our heart's aware of it, our lungs are, all the different systems in the body have their own needs for different chemicals and nutrients. And so when you look at the rate of anxiety today and the rate of depression and the rate of uh, learning disorders and the rate of behavioral issues and the rate of uh, violence in, in not only young people, but adults, the, the, the point I was trying to extrapolate from that is imagine how much of the unconsciously motivated fear and anxiety rising out of the body that the person's unconscious of is actually affecting their conscious desires and behaviors and how many people are being drugged because they're being labeled with ADD or depression or anxiety disorders when really how much of that's actually the the animal body saying you must eat real food you must get some greens you must eat some raw food you're dying it, it, absolutely it's a cry it's a cry a scream for yeah, help right, right. In, in its own way and then <clears throat> you think about so you grow your own food we do too and you know that when you grow it yourself you try to find good varieties and it's picked ripe yeah right? you pick it ripe and we took some of things that were growing to Colorado for this hike and it was it was so cool to see so let's take tomatoes that are in our that we've grown took a ton of those over there put them in the salad the first night and immediately um, one of the people said wow those tomatoes are incredible where did they come from well there you go see they they know yeah they knew they that's absolutely it this doesn't taste like anything in the store. You're right, it doesn't, because it's it's been grown in good soil and it's picked fresh and so forth. And that goes to all the food. And the body then, as you're saying, you get unwholesome foods. That whole notion of let food be thy medicine, that 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 is absolutely on target, right? Yes. And we've gotten so far away from that. I'll tell you of an experience I had. I think it was my son Mana's third or fourth birthday party and we had like 16 other kids and their parents come and we went to a place we rented a room and we hired an an, uh, an art teacher and the kids did water coloring and all that but we we brought food to the um for, for everybody and we had you know all certified organic top-notch salads uh uh, broccoli, a bunch of stuff. And I'm sitting there and I'm just looking around the room and I'm looking at what's on everybody's plate. And interestingly enough, not one child in the room had any vegetables on their plate except my son. And he was eating raw broccoli like it was candy. And several of the parents said to me at different times throughout the party, wow, your child really likes vegetables. I can't get my child to eat vegetables. And the other kids had cookies, cake, and a piece of meat. Instead of getting vegetables for dinner, they went, they got, they got whatever it was, chicken or whatever, and then they went right to the cookies and the cake, but they had no vegetables. And when the parents said that to me, they said, well, how do you get your kid to eat vegetables? I said, well, the first thing you do is you feed them real vegetables from real soil because the reason they don't like to eat vegetables is because there's nothing in them. But when you've, if your children were actually to go taste those vegetables, you might find that all of a sudden they want them. But they've been conditioned to think they don't like broccoli because they've been eating dead broccoli that's got nothing in it. And now they have to gravitate to whatever they think 
will fill them. And that is the cake, the cookies, and the meat that they've been conditioned to eat. And of course, we had organic meat there too. But I've seen over and over again, if you actually give children vegetables, like my kids walk right down and pick tomatoes out of the garden, peppers out of the garden. They eat them just like candy. In fact, the other day, this is a funny one. Um, <laughs> we, we, uh, the girls cook some fish and they cook the fish whole. And one, one of my, we have a, a guy that one of my students lives with us and he helps us on the farm. And, uh, he said to he he said sitting at the table with Mon and Zoe he goes hey have you ever tried fish eyeballs before, and the kids said no do they taste good he said yeah he said here and he popped the eyeball out and gave one to Zoe and one to Mana and they loved them and and we we had like several fish and they they ate all the eyeballs they thought that was the greatest thing, and, you know recently he we caught we we got a problem with squirrels so we've been capturing squirrels and eating them. And the kids love the, the organs out of the squirrels and they, they dig that stuff. Most people look like they're feeding their kids empty garbage, white meat chicken from a factory where the chicken's been living its whole life eating garbage and it's been dying the whole time and scared to death the whole time. And, you know, we could go off on a long journey on that one. But, you know, this is like, this is the the very infrastructure, not only of our physiology, but our emotional health and our psychological health. Absolutely the case. Absolutely the case. And and we've so detached from all of that, we aren't even aware anymore, right? And I just to second the point that you made, I think it's so true. You, you, you can understand totally why young children don't like fruits and vegetables when they're coming from the store. There is no, there's no, not, no nutri no nutrition in that, no phytochemical richness. And so the body's saying, you know, don't it's not even worth eating this stuff. And absolutely. they're loaded with chemicals. Yes, absolutely. Then you add that on top of the whole work. So yeah, and that's that's the issue then. But boy, when you can get people to to try to experience that, to taste and experience that, it just really struck me there when we were in Colorado. It, it was an instantaneous thing. And Thinking of some carrots that we grew too, and people, you know, they just rave. Huh? People just rave about about fresh vegetables when uh, when they're good varieties, grown on good foods, picked when they're ripe, and so forth. Yeah, you know, Fred. Even though there's an underground revival of awareness uh, occurring at this time regarding the primacy of the soil and the soil food web. Um, that you know, people it's emerging that people are waking up to it. There there appears to be dangerously little awareness of the importance of natural or organic farming principles and what is actually done to the soil and therefore uh the produce, the the and the flesh foods people are eating. The fish farming industry is unregulated, and research shows that farm fish is uh even more toxic than commercially farmed animals. Currently, only four to six percent of the food eaten worldwide is actually real organic food. I make that distinction because there's so many bogus organic certifications yep. out there. That means 94 to 96 percent of all the food eaten is not only dangerously toxic, but every dollar spent on such foods is contributing to the destruction of our topsoils and our ecosystems worldwide. So can you share your thoughts on why this abortion of the truth of soil science, farming and food production continues in the presence of sound research? and evidence of the clear and present dangers to humanity and the nature and nature uh, due to these commercial approaches. In other words, we have all the science. It goes all the way back to the 30s and even back to the peasants. You, Rudolf Steiner talked about this. Rudolf Steiner was actually asked by the German government to intervene and help them figure out how to get nutrition back into the soil in the late 1800s before they were even using pesticides because they realized there was a nutritional problem. And that's how biodynamic farming got created. Now, here we are, you know, this is 2022. He was doing this in the late 1800s, and they thought it was an issue then. We're so far down this rabbit hole, but I've got a library full. I've got 800 papers by William A. Albrecht. I've got Arden Anderson's books. I've got hundreds of books and papers that are all saying exactly what you're saying and what your research is saying. So it's not a question that we don't know what the truth is. 
It's not even a question that that truth's not available in universities. I can go to any university in the United States or probably anywhere in the world and within minutes find the very evidence that what we're doing is wrong. Yet these universities continue to do this and so do labs and so do food manufacturing corporations. The government turns a blind eye, allows it, and even has passed laws. So now, you know, an example I'll give you is I show this to my students. I like, hey, look, based on current labeling laws, all they got to do is put artificial flavors. And so I took a popular protein shake that's sold and bodybuilders consume it like it's going out of style. And I did research to find out it was strawberry flavored. So I looked up in food manufacturing journals and food processing journals, what goes into, what are the ingredients in the artificial flavor strawberry? And there was 42 chemicals that they didn't have to put on the label. So I showed my on a slide, I say, look, this is what they left off the label. And you just look at it and think it's fine. Okay, so the, the, my question to you is, why do we have intelligent people in universities and in nutrition departments and in governments that know damn well what the truth is, but they turn a blind eye to it and we're destroying not only nature, but the human race? by poisoning them to death, and this continues to happen? Yeah, it's, it's a good question, Paul, and so many, so many thoughts come to mind. I imagine so, especially with your mind. <laughs> no, a lot come to mind. Let me tell a story that, that kind of, <clears throat> that I think about quite a lot. So we're living in Ennis, Montana nowadays, and we've been coming up here for maybe 50 years, like, like many people because of the, the beauty of the state of Montana and the big rivers. And, and coming, we've been coming up here to fish the rivers. And the first time I fished the Madison River roughly 50 years ago, um, a friend floated me down a stretch of the river and I probably I caught a lot of fish, a lot, a lot of fish, virtually every cast catching fish. And they were big, big fish for me anyway. And I, I was just blown away that, that there, there was something like that. So we were living in Logan still at the time. I was working at Utah State University, and I was talking to an old-time fellow there, and I was raving about the rivers up here, and he said, you know, I can't even stand to go up there anymore. He said, my memory's too long. He said, you think the fishing's good now? You should have seen it 50 years ago. Wow. And now, so now we're 50 years on from when I first came up here. And my wife and I really can't stand to even float the river. It's just overrun with, with guides, which I don't have anything personal against them. But there's just so many people fishing that river. And if you catch a teeny little fish, a few of them, you've done well. The, so why do I tell that story? The point is, I have friends who come up here and they think, oh, my gosh, it's incredible up here. You know, it's, it's incredible. And uh, I think... It's easy over time to get dumbed down, huh? In increments, in increments, in increments, in increments. And I think beginning with the Green Revolution back in the day, and they're thinking, you know, how do we feed eight to eleven billion people that are projected into into this century? And then the whole industrial farming and food system and practices really took over during our lifetimes, right? I mean, when mm -hmm. I was on the ranch and growing up, um, not long before that, animals were still being finished on pastures. Feedlot systems hadn't really taken off until after World War II and some of those things. So, But now I think it, people have been so dumbed down. And I don't think most people truly understand the huge influence of corporate, political, and academic interests in this whole business. And, you know, you're in academics and... Uh, you need to get research funding. And I saw many people as I went along that, that were heavily involved in research um, funded by corporate by corporate interests. And I think I think the researchers themselves too become, you know, we get in silos in universities, right? We get into silos and you've got the different departments. Whereas it really should be one big department that's looking at the world, right? And everything that's going on and thinking about all the interrelationships. But 
it's easy to get into silos and then you just keep burrowing in further and further and further into your particular sub-discipline. And, uh, you know, I think that that can lead to, to much of what you, you're talking about. Jane Buxton has a new book out, The Great Plant-Based Con, and it's really, uh, it's, a, it's a great book. She did a great job with it. But there's a chapter in there in particular that she asked me to review as she was working on the book titled Follow the Money. And we're all aware of this money business, right, in a yeah. general sense, and even some specifics. But boy, oh boy, did she, did she, does she, that book's out now, does she bring that home in terms of, of what happens with all this, all this business uh, of, of following the money and so forth. And that book's out in audio books, she told me, too. What's it called? The Great Plant-Based Con. Right on. Hi, everybody. I'm excited to share Symbiotica's new molecular hydrogen supplement. I don't know if you've studied molecular hydrogen at all, but Dr. Mercola is very big on it, has a number of articles about it. It is a very good free radical scavenger, so it helps protect against oxidative stress, which is a real important thing in our environment today. And some people find that it helps with recovery and improves athletic performance. I've known people who have used it and told me it definitely enhanced things like their deadlift, particularly their performance when doing things like 5Ks and 10Ks. Molecular hydrogen is made of hydrogen. Hydrogen, you might remember, H2O is the key component next to oxygen in the water molecule. So it's very, very abundant in water throughout our body. But when you take it in this way, it's able to do other things that it can do when it's not coupled with oxygen directly. So it's a very, very hot product out right now. A lot of people speak very highly of it. So with the benefits of free radical scavenging, and reducing oxidative stress and potential benefits for enhanced recovery and athletic performance, it's probably a really good thing to give a try because the worst thing that can happen is you'll have a lot better health and better athletic performance. To get 15% off this product and all the other amazing products by Symbiotica, go to symbiotica.com and use the promo code L4D15 at checkout. That's symbiotica.com, C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com with the promo code capital L, the number four, capital D, and the number one five. Let me also mention a couple of other things that uh, we'll see how far we want to go on this. There's so many facets that strike me, but you know, this whole idea of bias, bias in research, and then outright deception in research. Those two things, you know, it's hard. It's hard not to. We, we all come with um, with biases that we probably don't even realize, you know, as a function of just being born and raised, you, you acquire a certain kind of beliefs and so forth. So we all have that. And as you mentioned earlier, one of the strengths of science is really trying to separate those biases from, from data huh? and trying to, to design experiments that, um, that really do good tests of, of scientific hypotheses, not that are trying to, to just support some, some idea and, uh, or some corporation and so forth. But but it's a challenge, and you know you develop you develop hypotheses about how the world's working, and I think one of the strengths of science is this idea that you can never prove a theory. You you're, you're always all you can do is disprove them. That keeps you in this mode of humility. It's meant to keep you in the mode of you know you never can prove anything. Ultimately, in science, in, in terms of a theory, you're always open. And you realize then that there's always limitations. I think of physics in that sense. You know, all the work that Einstein did on special and then general theory of relativity and, and how powerful that is, but it's still limited. And quantum, quantum mechanics and what they've learned. Well, now they say what we really need to do is try to figure out how to merge quantum and relativistic physics, right? And so it's this idea that that to keep you in humility, but sometimes, so biases can get into there. And, uh, you know, there are cases where we look back and I'm thinking of some of the human studies where, 
where there was bias, it wasn't it wasn't deliberate, it wasn't meant to be deceptive, but s some pet hypotheses that have developed on omega threes and and things like that that we can we can get into a little bit later on uh, related to supplements come to mind. But then you also get downright deception, where you can't let go of your pet hypothesis and. Uh, you know, what comes to mind nowadays are, are that links with what you've been saying is some of the work that was done on fat and sugar and uh, Ansel Keys, some of the, the studies that he did 50 years ago. Um, you know, he proposed the, uh, you, this. I'm telling you stuff you already know, but just saying it for the sake. Yeah. Can I just ask a quick question? Do you know of the book Eat Fat and Grow Thin by Robert McCarnus, MD, in 1958? You know, no, I don't know of that book. Is it a good one on this whole? Yes, topic? it's a very good book. It's a 1958 book. I believe right. he was. A, I Old think time. he was. I think he was a British medical doctor, but he exploded the whole carbohydrate thing right out of the water. Gives some fantastic rationale, but hardly anyone ever knows about that book. But it's called "Eat Fat and Grow Thin" by Robert yeah, yeah. McCarnus, MD, and it, it's a fantastic book. And it's one of of a number of I've read out there like that but it's it's amazing how everybody finds all the shitty books but hardly anyone knows about the good ones <laughs> no i it's true and you know what that does too is it shows you the a lot of those quote old timers were pretty savvy about oh, what was yes. going on huh oh yeah you know i tell people look they say that you know, people often say to me, why do you quote such old research in all your lectures i say because prior to 1950 scientists were not influenced so much by money and corporate agendas they were interested in finding the truth yes that's right that that real desire to and to try to keep bias and definitely deception out of that yes right? yeah and so it's true and i think of yudkin pure white sweet pure white and deadly or whatever yeah his book on sugar right oh, you know? And I think of another one, too, by Roger Williams, an old timer on biochemical individuality. I've read it multiple times. He made that point I was making on genes plus environment plus chat. So it's true. And so, you know, but boy, since those days, fat really got a, a, a bad a bad rap, right? Mm -hmm. fat, fat got a, a hugely bad rap. And. And books I've read talking about Ansel Keys and, you know, the idea that replacing saturated fat with vegetable oil rich in omega-6s uh, would lower cholesterol and, and uh, so forth was really became, that was his pet hypothesis, right? Mm -hmm. We forgot to that put in, lower so cholesterol it, and trigger a huge inflammatory syndrome. <laughs> yes, that ab absolutely. You know, so... To me, that became sort of the epitome of a strongly held belief that saturated fat's the bad guy. And what was amazing, though, and here's where, so you can develop hypotheses, we all do, but but you have to you have to design the studies, which he did. But then, when the data don't fit your hypothesis, you have to follow the data, right? You have to, I used to tell the students that all the time, and. You know, I had that over my career, and I used to get so frustrated sometimes um, when my pet hypothesis, the animals weren't agreeing with it. You know, they weren't, <laughs> doing, they weren't doing what I thought. And my wife, as wives will often do, would really, really, really put the knife in even deeper than she <laughs> Said, and she was right. She said, well, you're about to learn something, aren't you? And of course, I was pissed off, actually, <laughs> because it's frustrating. Here's you've got to. But she was right. And and what you learned is you have to go with the data. You have to go with the data. But so Ansel Keese does these two trials, the Sydney Diet Heart Study and the Minnesota Coronary Experiment. And he did find replacing saturated fat with linoleic acid reduced serum cholesterol but it didn't reduce the risk of death from coronary heart disease or all cause mortality, right? Which right. Is Those people weren't. Rates of death increased from all causes, coronary heart disease and cardiovascular disease, when saturated fats were replaced with linoleic acid in those trials. So it didn't fit at all. And it wasn't until years later 
that some researchers got in and, and undug all those data and reported on what, what really went on. And, uh, you know, so that's that's a travesty, those kind of things. You've read Nina Teicholt's book, The Big Fat Surprise, no doubt. Uh, I haven't read that one. Her book, well, it's, it's to, you know, what she did was to document how a few researchers, through arrogance, bias, and institutional consensus, allowed hypotheses to become dogma, enshrined by expert committees and uh, politicians. And so the, the, the ensuing low-fat nutrition advice transformed dietary habits of people in the U.S. She's tracing the history of all this stuff in her book, The Big, the Big Fat Surprise. But then you get other industries. The sugar industry was playing off all this stuff too, right? They knew that there were concerns with, with, with sugar, but they thought, boy, we can pin all these issues on cholesterol and uh, and fat and, and put the blame on on coronary heart disease, on that sort of stuff. And so they, they funded research papers, they funded studies, and uh, to cast doubt on on fat and to to vindicate sugar. So, you know, it becomes a mess then. And if you're in the general public, what happens, I think, and this leads kind of to a, a last point that all, that strikes me. We, we could do more. I've got other, but... You know, there was a, a movie came out a few years ago, a documentary titled Merchants of Doubt. Have you seen that one? I think I might have. It's been out for a while. It's been out for a while. What it does is it it starts with big tobacco and it explains the playbook that big tobacco used over the years mm -hmm. to to uh, to cast doubt on the fact that there was any harm from smoking cigarettes. and you know, the pharmaceutical, chemical, agricultural industries, food, fossil fuel industries all picked up that playbook. And so this is this Merchants of Doubts follows the development of that history and then really focuses on changing climates in the fossil fuel industry. And, uh, you know, the, the fossil fuel industry, the scientists at Exxon back in the 70s, they had some really good scientists that were doing science. They, they were, were, were really focused on trying to understand. And they understood that burning fossil fuel, quote unquote, will cause dramatic environmental effects and, quote unquote, the potential problem is great and urgent. That was in the 70s wow. that they were doing that. You know what happened to them? They all lost their job. Of course <laughs> they did. You know, there's a, there's a, a great saying. You've probably heard it before. It's very hard to change a man's belief system when his paycheck depends on it. Right. That's absolutely the case. And it's it, not in Merchants of Doubt, but in a, in a Frontline special that I saw a year, year ago, they were just highlighting all of this and pointing out that rather than heed the findings of their own scientists, the, they, uh, they manufactured a counter narrative that challenged all the, the growing scientific data. Um, and of course, the same thing has happened in the food industry, right? Mm -hmm. That's the same thing. I think then, you know, as a result of these industry and political tactics, I really think that for many people in the U.S. nowadays, we're suffering an epistemological crisis. People are no longer certain what's true and what's not true or what to believe and what not to believe. Uh, if science has limits and scientists are frauds, which gets comes across in there. If nothing the media reports is reliable, if there really is no verifiable truth, then how does one differentiate between fake news and reality? At that point, there is no objective reality out there for people to agree upon just what you believe and the biased beliefs of others who disagree with you. I think we're really in a tough spot that way in terms of not only food, but, but virtually everything ecologically economically socially politically i think we're in a we're in a in a not very good spot nowadays in that sense no are you familiar with the books by harvey levenstein yes I'm, some yeah revolution at the table and paradox of plenty yes those are some very eye opening books yes they are they certainly are he talks about 
I, when was it? I think it was, uh, I think it was during the Second World War when they had bread lines and they kept telling people there was a meat shortage. He shows that cattle farmers were directed by the United States government and pig farmers and they killed six billion cattle and pigs and dumped them into rivers to get rid of them while the public was told that there was a meat shortage, which they used for, to, to then drive them to bread lines. And the rationale behind it was they did not want people dependent on government handouts. So they only wanted to give them as little as possible to support them. But meanwhile, billions of dollars worth of animals were killed and and thrown into rivers and wasted. Yeah, absolutely the case. I mean, this 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 is the kind of stuff the public doesn't know. And and this this kind of information is critical to understand right now, especially since COVID started, because people that believe what they're being told by mainstream media and by social media do not realize that their minds are being hijacked. And 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 this is my point in bringing that up is, you know, we're talking about stuff that's been going on since all the way back beginning, you know, in the 60s, particular, even a little earlier with the, and, and that's what Harvey uh, Levenstein lays out in, in uh, Paradox of Plenty and Revolution at the Table. He gives you the entire history of this whole thing. And when you, when you start looking at how much corruption there is going on and how much ulter ulterior motives, it's wake up, pay attention. Or you are going to be a sick, diseased person that's highly profitable, and your life is going to be shit. You know, yeah, absolutely, absolutely the case, and that <clears throat> that in turn really puts the onus on the individual to sort of, as we were saying, from the ranch standpoint, to to, to you've got to be looking out for yourself in that sense, and to realize that that. There's all this hijacking that's going on, huh? Yeah, corporate, political, academic kinds of things that that are that are taking place. That uh, yeah, you you've got to take responsibility for yourself, which means you've got to really get involved in in trying to figure out what's what. You know, my my students often say to me, Paul, how do you know the truth? And I say it's not that hard get naked and stand in front of the mirror. Your body never lies. Neither do your emotions, neither does your mental performance. Never judge a man by the creed he or she professes, but by the life he or she leads. If you go to sick doctors for health advice, you're not going to get healthy. You go to broken therapists to get your body fixed up, you're not going to get fixed up. You're just going to get a, a, a palliative Band-Aid, you know, pay attention to what your body's telling you. Learn to listen to your instincts, use your senses and participate in the responsibility of having a body. Absolutely. Absolutely, Paul. And I think and realizing that your body is unique. And so it's up to you to to tune into all of that. Right. Yeah. I mean, in principle, you can say what you said, and that's right on in terms of what to do. But in practice, then, or and in practice, then, I would say your body's unique, so you've got to take the responsibility for that, right? Yes. I recently had heard a conversation, and I know this from a transgenerational standpoint of, of uh, people that I very much like, but the comes from generations back, very authoritarian kind of, you know, this is the way it is, you do it this way, that's it. Not, not much leeway for you. To, Sounds like I Fauci. Could that, I could see that in these three generations as they were talking and we were doing, I don't want to get too specific, but, and there, so here's the youngest generation, 10 year old, and uh, the one is the, the mother saying one thing and then the, the grandfather is, is saying things and it's all pretty authoritarian and saying, well, you know, I found that this is the way. To do, and I just love that this this young kid said, but I'm not you, but I'm not you. And yeah. Like, there, you <laughs> there you go. You know, it's recognizing that that then, the, you know, you take responsibility for this this body. Right. That you. Yes. You 
Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll move to our, our next point, which we have covered a fair bit of, but I'll, I'll, I want to share some of the facts and figures that, that are here. Because I think a lot of people are completely and utterly clueless to what I'm about to unveil. I know you're not, but um, Fred, most people are oblivious to the dangerous chemicals put onto and into their food by corporate farming conglomerates and unconscious, unconscious farmers worldwide. I was recently researching the amount of pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and rodenticides being used worldwide today for my new book that I'm writing. And I was dead shocked at how much the volume of these chemicals has risen since I wrote my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy in 2001, which I published in 2004. And I did a ton of research to write the book. So I was very aware of the same amount of these chemicals then. And I didn't, I mean, when I found this, I'm like, oh my God, this is like unfreaking believable. When I did my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, I was shit shocked. So the most recent stats on worldwide pesticide use I could find were from 2017. And I gave you the the table yes. there. We're right? stunning. We're isn't stunning. that isn't that crazy? Like this. So those of you listening, this is just the top ten countries in the world for pesticide use. So it's it's in millions of kilograms per year. But I had Penny, who's much better at math than me, convert it to pounds. China in 2017 used three. 1,982 million pounds of pesticides. The United States used 851 million pounds of pesticides in 2017, and it's gotten worse since then. I've checked that. Argentina, 584 million pounds. Thailand, 192 million pounds. Brazil, 168 million pounds. Italy, 139 million. France, even France. The culinary country, 137 million pounds. Canada, 119 million pounds. Japan, 115 million pounds. India, 88 million pounds. Okay. Now, uh, let's just do a take a moment here. That totals up to 6.375 billion pounds of pesticides annually. And I checked, Fred, I did a research. I spent hours trying to find this out. Is there any country in the world that does not use pesticides? I could not find a single one. So the punchline is that these 10 countries are using 6.375 billion pounds of pesticides a year, and that's only 10 of 195 countries, okay? So what I did to help people understand this in my new book is I said, okay, a gallon of water weighs eight pounds. So I did the math. That turns out to be 15 million 973,550 gallon bathtubs of pesticides being dumped on our soil every year in only 10 countries. And we're wondering why we have all these behavioral problems and emotional problems and anxiety problems and depression problems. And when you start researching what those things do to your hormonal system, your physiology, your liver, and every part of your brain, it's mind boggling. Right. So I find it very interesting that those in the vegan and vegetarian movements rarely ever speak of the importance of eating from certified organic sources. The majority of the food they eat is toxic, dangerous and paradoxically destructive to birds and wildlife in general and natural habitats, many of which the vegans and vegetarians claim to be eating vegetarian to protect. So, Fred, my question for you is, can you share your thoughts in this regard? Any tips? or suggestions you have for listeners to help them make better choices with food and purchases? And where do you think this kind of the abuse of science and nature is leading us? Yeah, very good. Well, and such, such huge points. And again, I think it's, I have several thoughts. I think this lack of awareness, though, of, you know, as we've distanced ourselves, again, going back to where we started this conversation from actually growing foods ourselves and being involved in that process and realizing uh, what you just said about, um, especially regarding industrial agriculture and its influence in terms of tillage, pesticides, and so forth. And that, in fact, you think you're not killing animals, but below ground and above ground, you're wiping out huge numbers of different creatures. So, so that, that's that point. I, 
I think is is really important for people to realize and then going back to what we said on the sacredness of life. So, you know, all that goes back to Rachel Carson's book too, right? Silent, Silent Spring. Spring. 60 years ago now, yeah. September 27th, 1962, she published that book. Wow. And she was warning, right, that this is this is well, think now if she was alive she, and she saw that tape, she'd say, well, I probably didn't have much influence, right, where it's all gone. I, I actually just printed a, a comprehensive article looking at her whole life, and it shows how the chemical industry just attacked her and tried to discredit her. And it, it's a shocking article. It's very thorough. And I'm like, you know, here's someone who puts everything on the table to try to save humanity and gets turned into uh, a punching bag. Yeah, absolutely the case. And all for the dollar, huh? And then goes back to the point we were just making about how merchants of doubt and how, how doubt is cast on, on anything that's valid. Like, like she was raising a hugely important point and others have raised that too, but boy, that's where it, it can, can get discouraging. I want to raise uh, another point that comes to mind. So why do we use all these pesticides and herbicides and synthetic fertilizers, uh, not only in industrial agriculture, but in our yards as well? You know, it, it's, it's huge, the amount that we use in, our, in growing things. And I, I want to raise a point that maybe your listeners um, aren't aware of, that, but but it it leads to tips in a broad sense of things and uh you know so we were talking earlier i think a bit about this i mentioned that the plant plants produce these so-called primary compounds energy protein minerals and so forth and then there's this vast array of secondary compounds and i made the point that during the past 50 years ecologists have learned of the many primary roles for secondary compounds um there i put them under broad headings like protection from drought their sunscreen there're ways that plants actually protect themselves from other plants keep allelopathic effects and protect themselves from herbivores they're used in production of the of the plant Attraction of bees, for instance, you mentioned the bees, coloration, pollination, and growth. They're also vitally important in health, antioxidants, immune boosters, regrowth, and this is for the plant, the plant itself. So and that's just a, a partial list. Now, here's what I find really interesting is that at the same time ecologists were learning of the values of these secondary compounds. Agronomists were reducing their concentrations in both pasture plants for livestock to graze and um, in crops. So why did they do that? From the standpoint of pasture plants, we really had, took on an agronom uh, agronomic kind of viewpoint. Let's get the total mixed ration for pasture plant. Let's figure out a plant that has really high levels of growth and uh, We'll grow those in monocultures and we'll fatten animals out there on, on those pastures on these monocultures. Why did, why did they do that? Why did, and in the process then, we've got to reduce the concentrations of these secondary compounds. Why is that the case? They protect plants from being utilized too much. In natural plant communities, how does that work? If there's a diverse array of plants, what do animals do? They eat a little bit of this plant, a little bit more of that plant, a little bit of that plant. The plants are limiting the amount of use that the herbivores make of them, and it's spreading the load across the community. And animals are also figuring out complementarities. If I eat an appetizer of this plant, I can eat this plant a little bit more because they presumably don't know all the chemistry, but because the, the tannins in bird fruit tree foil actually form complexes with the alkaloids and endophyte and pectin tall fescue. There's all these kind, but we moved, we moved away from that. In, in crops, why did we do that? There's a cost to these secondary compounds. Plant, there's a cost to producing them. And so if you get, get rid of them, then you're able to produce more yield, right? The accent was always on yield, yield, yield. We forgot about phytochemical richness. So 
What that did by selecting for plants that had lower concentrations of these compounds, we made those plants more susceptible to environmental hardships. In their stead, we've come to rely on fossil fuel-based pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers to grow and protect plants in monoculture. Plants originally did that, though. <laughs> we've come also, from an animal standpoint, to rely on antibiotics and anthelmintics to treat diseases and parasites. Animals use those as ways to do that, um, as, we were, as we were talking. So as a result then, where we are now, I think, to produce one calorie of food requires two calories of fossil fuels for machinery, fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, and so forth. Um, we use another eight to 12 calories to process, package, deliver, store, and cook modern food. Wow. No creature in the wild could survive a week on that kind of budget, right? You're, you're, you're in debt. You're in huge debt. That's a suicide the mission right there. It's a suicide mission. And so uh, the reason I raised that, and you know, and I got to know when I was writing Nourishment, and I've a little bit gotten out of that, but I got to know some uh, some people that are involved in plant selection programs at universities, I think trying to do honest kind of research that we're thinking about the value of those secondary compounds and can we get them back into, back into plants? And what roles can they play, in not only in the health of the plant, but in the health of the human being as well? And so I, I thought, you know, this is really, this is neat kind of work that from a more general standpoint could move us out of all these fossil fuel based herbicide pesticide insecticide loops and back in the other in the other direction hi everybody i'm super excited to tell you about organifi gold chocolate something that is very tasty and that my kids love. Organifi Gold Chocolate is a superfood hot chocolate healthy enough to drink every day. In fact, multiple times a day if you want. In fact, unlike most chocolate drinks that stimulate you and may disrupt your sleep if consumed after about four in the afternoon, my kids drink it right before bed, and unlike chocolate in general, it actually helps them sleep. Organifi Gold Chocolate doesn't include blood sugar spiking ingredients like other hot chocolate alternatives, leaving you feeling good about indulging in this healthy chocolate beverage. It was formulated to deliver the same amazing benefits as Organifi Gold, but with a delicious chocolate flavor to help curb those holiday cravings, which we all seem to get. Some of the key benefits of Organifi Chocolate Gold, or gold chocolate, is that it has 10 superfoods for rest and relaxation. 100% USD organic certified, tastes delicious in warm water and amazing with milk or milk alternatives, promotes and supports relaxation so you can fall asleep with ease, supports a better night's rest so you wake up refreshed, and promotes a healthier response to stress, and gives calming support. As you know, what most people reach for when they want something super tasty and enjoyable is generally not healthy, but that's not the case with Organifi Gold Chocolate, which is USDA certified organic, certified gluten-free, and certified glyphosate residue-free, which is very important, dairy-free, which is great for guys like me, soya-free, which is very important, vegan, non-GMO, and clinically proven ingredients, 100% organic whole food, which means it's great for everyone. Save 20% on your purchase of Organifi Gold Chocolate by using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. That's check 20 on checkout. Go to Organifi.com, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I, dot com forward slash check 20 and again for your 20 percent living 40 discount use the code check 20 in all caps enjoy organifi gold chocolate i participated in a symposium many years ago now about the time i retired i guess it was in boston and the title of it was farm ecology pharmacological aspects of ecology and it was very much about these kind of issues that, that you're raising right now. And the lady that organized the symposium that was trained in chemical ecology. And then, as she said, I quote, went to the dark side and worked for five years. <laughs> and she really she learned a huge amount about what was going on. And then she came back and uh, got a position in academia. And she's still still working in that. 
But what she did in that symposium was to draw people together from, from around the world that are thinking about and talking about what we're talking about and thinking about ways to get out of these fossil fuel-based pesticide loops that we're in. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of ways. Again, it goes back to what we were talking about, of thinking about natural systems. How did they work? What were the roles of all these? How were plants and, and animals and humans functioning back in the day? And how can we get back in back into those uh, those loops? So that's one one thought I think for um, for listeners and and I think too to support people who are doing the kind of practices we're talking about. For instance, farms that combine no-till practices, cover crops, diverse rotations. Um, they're producing crops that are higher in many vitamins, minerals, and phytochemicals. They're doing, th they're trying, they're getting out of these fossil fuel based herbicides, kill things loops, and thinking about how can we grow really healthful food. And there are some long term ecological studies that show when you have diverse arrays of plants uh, that are phytochemically rich, you increase. Um, you increase the nutrient content hugely. You know this and you've talked about it, but you increase huge nutrient content hugely for, for herbivores as well as for human beings. You're also much better able to build up carbon, 30 to 90 percent more water and nutrient hold, holding carbon in those soils. And so this whole idea of plant diversity, the value of plant diversity, for the health of plants and for life below ground and above ground becomes very, very important. And the ability of those soils then to, to fix, to create life and to fix, um, to fix carbon in the soil. You know, listeners may or may not know that nutrient inputs from living roots are two to 13 times more efficient than litter inputs at forming both so, slow cycling mineral associated soil organic carbon and fast cycling particulate organic carbon. And what happens, these nutrients from roots stimulate microbial populations below ground, going back to the, the microbiome, the microbiome in the soil. When you have diverse arrays of plants and they're producing variety of these primary and secondary compounds and putting inputs into the soil, you create these diverse arrays of of microbial populations, and they're what actually ends up fixing carbon down in the soil in huge, huge ways. Over 50% of all soil organic carbon uh, adhering to mineral surfaces and forming these soil aggregates is mediated by these microbial populations. So that that's a huge deal. So supporting people that are, that are farming in ways that are creating health, I think, would be one one tip. I would say. Another one that, that I'll make on this question is, you know, most people don't own farms or ranches, as we've been talking, been getting away from that. But many people have yards that uh, can put them back in touch with wholesome plants and perhaps animals uh, as well. Um, so... I always tell people now, if possible, and I know everybody's busy and blah blah blah, but try to, in some way, raise your own raise your own food, grow vegetable, herbal, medicinal gardens, perhaps even have a few chickens, and encourage native plants to grow on your land as well. Get away um, from these resource intensive um, things that we're doing. Here's some figures for you, and they're a bit. I'm sure there's even more now, but when I wrote Nourishment, over 30,000 tons of synthetic pesticides at a cost of well over 2 billion, uh, not to mention all the herbicides and fertilizers, are used to weed and feed our lawns. We're not talking wow. our lawns. Over 30,000 tons. It's figures like you're saying. Over 800 million gallons of gasoline. The gas spilled alone, refilling lawnmowers, is 17 million gallons here in the U.S. Each wow. 1.57 times more than the amount spilled by the Exxon Valdez. Off That's the shore of crazy. It's crazy. Now, here's the one I think about all the time now in the arid west. Residual water use outside the home is 30 to 60 percent of total water use. 
depending on the estimate, seven to nine billion gallons of water are used each day for suburban irrigation. So, you know, thinking about ways to cut our water use with all that's coming out down nowadays in the in the arid west and the Colorado River system and on and on and on. Um, you know, I think thinking from a personal standpoint about what what can we do? And it goes back to the basics where we started. And, you know, I know there's a million reasons and, and I don't know where society's gone. I often think <clears throat> When I was reviewing anthropological literature for nourishment, you know, we thought that the Industrial Revolution would, would give us more time, right? More time to for leisure and to do all the things that we yeah. like. It's actually gone the other direction. Not only has it gone the other direction, but, you know, the average American last time I checked was spending uh, something like $7,000 a year on medical drugs and, and doctor's visits and surgery. And, you know, I'm, 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 I'm saying to people, how much organic food could you buy for 7,000 bucks? Absolutely the case. When you're looking at cost benefit, that's what, that's the broader picture that has to be looked at. And then we think of the indigenous peoples as, you know, they were kind of maybe I don't know what's the right word, but they, they're not, not so, you know, whatever. But they actually spent very little time making their livings, you know, hunting and gathering. Yeah. They had a lot of time for leisure. And, yes. and some of them, when they came to the bifurcation point, they said, we don't want to go down that path. We enjoy life. We, and what were they eating? They were eating incredibly wholesome foods, right? Foraging, hunting, gathering. And you think, oh, man, they spent forever doing that. No. Many of the the accounts that I read, it was just the opposite. They had a lot of time to enjoy being alive, right, on this planet. Now you see people running so fast, husband and wife's both working, and that's where I was launching off that, you know, it, it, it takes a bit of time to, to graze your own food, right? I mean, even, even in your yard, to grow a garden, that takes a bit of time. But I think the rewards in terms of, Costs, as you're saying, for health, if you really get into that, and and mental health as well, the grounding and centering that you can get just from interacting. You know, it's amazing. We've got some chickens here in our place, and uh, we're not supposed to have them, strictly speaking. Long story, I won't go into it, but we've got them, and we've got a chicken palace that we built for them. We turn them out each day so they can forage. You know? Yeah, so we do too. Forage. It's so fun. Yeah. It's fun. And you know, you might think, well, what could be more boring? But no, it's have, great. I, they're it so, is, they're so have, interesting. It is. And we have people from the city who come here, to quote the city. And it's amazing. They love to do, they love to sit. Th they say, it's so calm. It's so peaceful. It's so, you know, and just watching those birds pick here and pick there. And they come across the grasshopper and they chase it there and so forth. And, you know, and it's interesting. So we designed this chicken palace with all these things in mind of how the chickens would maybe use it and little roost in this part of the house we made. And it was so interesting to see how they end up, you know, they much prefer the rafters that I built to the little roost. And just it's that idea that that they're not that creatures aren't idiots that you were talking about earlier, that that there there's a tremendous amount of knowledge. And in plants as well, but you have to tune in and you have to pay attention and you have to, you have to get on chicken time, right? You have to get on chicken <laughs> time, you have to get on broccoli time. And then you start to, you start to quiet, quiet this ego, ego chatter that in the mind and you start to realize I'm no different from that chicken or that goat. Or if you get into plants, 20 senses or more that they possess. And you know, we think we're so clever, and it goes back to the herbicide part of this discussion. You know, there's, what, 596 herbicide-resistant plants on the planet now? Oh, my God, that's so but dangerous. Plants are, plants are the ultimate biochemists. You know, we yeah. think certainly I give credit to biochemists, and you take a class in biochemistry and you appreciate that for science is what science did for me more than anything, is just to appreciate to get a glimpse of the, the incredible, phenomenal complexity and beauty of this, this world and everything that's in this world.
from what we would consider, quote, inanimate rocks to the plants to, and the plants, it's just amazing how, how much is going on in the senses. They, they breathe, they, they inhale, they exhale. All these phytochemicals we're talking about, that becomes the language of these plants. That they have they relationships. Yes, they absolutely They have families. They, they talk to one another. They, yep, they support each other. Yes. And they so move you, nutrients. They communicate with the insects. I mean, there's a yeah. symbiotic really. I mean, the, the, when you start looking at what what's cut out of the mind of the people that are using chemicals and especially genetically modified organisms and how dangerous that is because it totally is ignorant of all the effects that the genes have and how they're so intricately woven together. You're playing Russian roulette like I've never seen. It's unfreaking believable. You are. And you know what the plants and the animals are doing in relation to all of that? They're very quickly outsmarting GM corn, for instance, or GM cotton. When I was writing nourishment, it, it takes no time for the insects to counter that, you know, to, to, to develop resistance to that. Genes plus it, plus ever-changing environments, plus chance. They're, they're constantly, they're a step ahead of you all the time. And so you create all these, um, we have a neighbor that uh, is kind of the, the opposite. I shouldn't, well, but anyway, you know, to into the total monoculture, blue, blue, bluegrass in the lawn, not one weed is allowed. So we're going to put on the herbicide to no end. And, and she was telling my wife, you know, this herbicide we got this year doesn't seem to be working so well. We must have got a bad bag. And my wife said, did you ever hear of antibiotic resistant bacteria? Yeah. Said, yeah. She was in the, well, think about that in terms of weeds. That's exactly what you're doing. So you're selecting for dandelions that are resistant to 2,4-D basically is what you're doing. So it's it's an arms race. It's a chemical arms race that we're we're never going to win. That they're they're ten steps ahead of us. So going back to what we were saying, how do we think ecologically about these systems, and how do we start to work within those systems as a part of that? And that's why I had that long diatribe there about you know the roles that these compounds play, and thinking about that, and thinking about and. You know, for instance, right now, Paul, if my wife and I were to go for a walk in the in the mountains, there's probably 12 different species of, of low-growing shrubs or forbs that are producing berries now, from um, choke cherries and service berries to uh, huckleberries and grouse whortleberries and you name it. And it's delicious. You can go for a walk and you can just pick some of these berries. But I want to make a point. The berries are tasty for certain, but they're not just sweet. They're not just sweet. They have this richness that's coming from this phytochemical complexity. And so you you eat those and your body is benefiting from, from all that complexity, I would say, that's in those, those different plant species. And when we, when we select against that to, to increase growth at the expense of phytochemical richness, we're really shooting ourselves in the foot in every way conceivable, as you're making good points, and we're both are related to health. And then the costs, the costs of all this business are it's astronomical. Astronomical. <laughs> yeah, astronomical. We're in tune point. with that one. Yeah. And so, you know, that, uh, you know, and what, where you, you had a comment on that thing. Where, where is it? Where has it led us? was a comment you had, it's led us to participating in the sixth mass extinction of all life on earth. That's right. Where that's, where that's led us as we moved away from these ways that we're talking about that put you in touch with nature. You know, and as I mentioned, indigenous peoples from around the world warned European immigrants about the dangers of breaking our linkages. That's when you read of their writings and that. And I often think of Aldo Leopold in his book, The, the Sand County Almanac. And, uh, you know, here's a quote. He said, conservation is getting nowhere because it is incompatible with our Abrahamic concept of land. We abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. 
There is no other way for land to survive the impact of mechanized man, nor for us to reap from it the aesthetic harvest it is capable under science, and he was talking the kind of science that you're, uh, of contributing to, to culture. So his book, that's 75 years ago, he's writing about that stuff in Sand County Almanac, and it was an impassioned plea. I've read that. You know, it, the the first part of the book is just these accounts of relationship with nature. And I know why he wrote it that way. He was trying to get people to think of the beauty of nature and every facet of it and how just these touching stories of that. But, you know, he was trying then to get the company, quote, back, the, quote, the company back in step. But, you know, if he were to come alive again to now, I think... He would, you just wonder in some ways, it seems like an inexorable march to the sixth mass extinction and so forth. But, um, you know, what uh, we do, what we can do, and we try our best from what, what little we know. Huh? I often think for me, for me. You know, here's sort of a, a joke, uh, but not such a joke. You know, no, you and I both know how intelligent plants and animals are. And just the way they've figured out how to get around all the chemicals and they become resistant and so do the insects. The question is, what's going to happen when they realize that they need to get rid of us to survive? If I, if I, if I was a betting man, I'd bet they're going to get rid of us. <laughs> they'll, do, they'll, they'll win that race. They'll yeah, win that race. But there's a lot more of them than us and they're a lot older than us. People for, forget, you know, they're a much, much older uh, forms of intelligence than we are. In fact, Rudolf Steiner gives a description of the Christian cross that most people are unfamiliar with. He says, if you take the cross that's planted in the ground from the ground up, he said, well, the earth that it's planted in represents the soil and the life of the soil. From the ground to the horizontal beam represents the plant kingdom. The horizontal beam represents the animal kingdom, and from the horizontal beam up represents the human head. So he says what you don't realize about that cross is the story of the evolution of man, and you are all that. And if you forget that, you're in big trouble. Amen. Amen to that. <laughs> Makes me think of some of the writings of Stephen Jay Gould, too, talking about the little tiny things that really have been dominant on this earth forever. There's a few few, quote, bigger creatures that come and go, but they don't last long. 99.9% .9 of them that have ever been here are gone now. Yes. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't in our hubris, think that that can't happen to us either, right? I have a no, friend, yeah, absolutely. I have a friend who likes to say, don't ever say this can't happen to me, you know, when I'm yes. saying for us as a species, that's, that's hubris to the max, huh? Yes. Are you familiar with the book 10,000 Years, uh, Metabolic Man, 10,000 Years from Eden by Charles Heiser Worthen? No, it sounds like a fabulous book. It is. It's a fantastic book. He's a naturalist and he gives extensive research and he did a lot of research on how much time did it take the average hunter-gatherer society to meet their food needs from hunting and gathering. He calculated that the average hunter-gatherer society could eat, meet their food, hunting, and gathering needs in about three to three and a half hours a day. And that's absolutely what I was reading in the anthropological literature that I reviewed. Maybe I came across some of his as well, and didn't the name didn't stick. But yeah, that's that. And and they enjoy. They were able. This is what strikes me is they were able to, to so much enjoy simply being alive and a part on this planet as opposed to just running, running, running constantly. Is it any wonder that there's so much emotional and physical stress and, and illness? How huh? the, the life we the life we live? He makes some other interesting points I'd like to share with you in the audience. He says he says, while the parents of the children, the young adults were out hunting and gathering. The children were left with the grandparents who were the wisest, eldest people in the tribe who were responsible for educating the children because they had the most empathy, compassion, and wisdom, and they knew how to raise children because they had the most life experience. And then when the mothers and fathers came back from hunting and gathering, they spent the rest of the day having fun, doing arts and crafts, singing, dancing, and enjoying life. 
Hey, man, I, I think that's such a <clears throat> such a hugely important point that I, I love to make. So I mentioned earlier that, that these domestic and wild creatures end up in extended families. There's relationships within those families and so forth. And I often think that same thing and talk about it, you know, when you've made the point, but it's, you know, that value of extended family and, and parents and grandparents and the roles that they play. I think when I grew up in Salida, this little town of Salida, it was still a community. It's not now. And that's all gone. All that's gone. But so we had extended family. We had our parents, but we had the great aunts, the grandparents. And it's amazing to me. I've always thought how much um, I gravitated to those older people and how much I listened to them, you know, their stories and what it was like. It was no cognitive, rational, analytical kind of thing. It was just like an a, a heart level connection to them. And they were so calm always, so calm and so wise. The parents were, were busy and so forth. And and then there was the broader, the broader relationships of the families with other families. And I tell you, it just it, it was amazing to grow up in that in that community. Um, you've probably heard the story of those Italian immigrants from Ro Rosotto Valfortore. Have you heard that story? Not Rosotto sure. No, I don't, I'm not sure. It's making the same points that we're making. Um, they were from Italy and they came, I think, to Pennsylvania years ago. And uh, they 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 had incredibly powerful community. Um, the the men worked in the quarries, the women in, in dress shops, and and that the what gets emphasized is just how tight knit the community. Every night the church bells would ring, they'd all gather, they'd cook these foods that according to some modern nutrition advice were horrible for you, you know, and, and so forth. Um, but they were all, they had very little cardiovascular disease. They, they, they were fine. And then they had this, they had this wish for their children to grow up and, and, uh, you know, and, and become members, work, members of society. Uh, how do you say it? And, and their dream got fulfilled. All the children grew up, moved away from the town they were living in. Their incidence of heart disease and everything went right up to the national population. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it's a neat story. It's a neat story, but it it, it emphasizes that that value of community and uh, in in all this all of this. It's it's wonderful story. Well, Fred, it's been a phenomenal journey. We've had almost three hours. It's gone by in a flash for me, and I'm just absolutely enamored and so uh, taken by your stories. And I just feel like I'm I'm with the wise elders that were that are missing in the world, and I I get to benefit from all your life experience and wisdom. And you know, we're only on question five of the dialogue points that I had of fifteen, so. I want to keep going, and I, I, I think you agree this is important. So why don't we just end this here and continue in our next episode and just keep going for as many episodes as it takes and leave everybody with the best we can offer them. Are you up for that? I absolutely am up for that and couldn't agree more with everything you said. And I feel the same way about your knowledge and what you're sharing as well. I love that we're having this dialogue and let's just go as long as it goes. Yes, and, and let's let it unfold organically. And I hope everybody listening is enjoying this. I mean, you, you I, I think any of you listening know you're dealing with someone who has a lot of life experience as a genuine scientist and is teaching us things that we've got to pay attention to because the cost of not doing it may not be a rapid death, but it'll be a very slow and uncomfortable one. And all you got to do is look around you at the world, and it's obvious that's what's going on. But our dream is to support all of you in living and loving fully and being the change the world needs right now. So I'll close by saying thank you, Fred. Thank you to the sponsors. Thank you to all of you for listening. And thank you for anything you buy from the sponsors that supports the podcast. And thank you to the sponsors for all their amazing products, their sustainability 
and their commitment to making the world a better place and feeding us and supporting us with their products. So I look forward to sharing another great podcast with you soon. I look forward to part two, part three, part 10, however many it takes, but I'm going to, I'm going to be like a parasite and I'm going to drink Fred's wisdom and share it with all of you. So lots of love, everybody. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Paul. It, it, it is wonderful to meet you and to see what you're doing. I, I'm happy, happy that I can be a part of that. I'm happy that I can be a part of that. It's really, um, boy, and I love that last, well, I love all the stories, all the stories that you've had. And that's the beauty, as you're saying, of the dialogue. It's a sharing, a sharing of world, of life experiences, and uh, it's rich in that sense. Aho, great spirit. See you next time, everybody. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Fred Provenza. You can learn more about Fred's work through his books, Nourishment, What Animals Can Teach Us About Rediscovering Our Nutritional Wisdom, Foraging Behavior, Managing to Survive in a World of Change, and The Art and Science of Shepherding, Tapping the Wisdom of French Herders, which are all available on Amazon.com and all good booksellers. Follow Paul on Instagram and TikTok at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. You can also watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at checkinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs, and learn more about the Czech Academy. You can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcasts.